great. The meeting is being recorded now. Uh, we do want to add a topic about discussion around the 20 to 21 academic year um, school choice uh, slots, which uh, Annie, I believe that was the only adjustment to the agenda. That's correct. That's the only adjustment to the agenda. Great. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank the public for being with us. I see we have, um, we're bordering 70 participants here uh, and growing. So really appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, and I recognize our last meeting did run a couple hours and we had a great discussion before we were able to open for public comment. So what we've done with this meeting is we actually have two public comment periods. We have one uh, before the review and discussion of the, of the plans um, and one will be after. So. Uh, the public comment process, I'll just uh, go a quick review of that, is that if you would like to make a public comment, I would ask that you raise your digital hand, um, which should be available at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Uh, it might be in your participants window, kind of every layout is a little different and I'm on a Mac, so it's slightly different, but we just need to know that you would like to make a comment. Um, I will call through the list of commenters. We do ask, um, as is being projected here, thank you very much, uh, that um, comments, speakers are allowed three minutes to present their material. It will be timed. Uh, I'm not going to put a cap on the public comment right now. We're just gonna allow everybody three minutes. Um, if you, We would like to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. So if you would like to speak again, I'm gonna have to ask that we wait until um, everybody has had an opportunity to speak. Again, keep in mind, we will have two uh, periods of comment, one before the presentations and one after. The thing about public comment as shown here is that uh, we will generally not respond to speakers as part of public comment. It's really not a, a Q&A session. Uh, and we wanna make sure that um, improper conducts or remarks, you know, that we, we don't um, have room for that here, uh, that folks um, please follow the guidelines and I, I trust that everybody will. And so uh, with that, again, I'm gonna ask if you would like to speak that you raise your digital hand and I will go in the order that uh, when you raise it, it will kick you up to the top of the list. So I hey, see our Heather, this is Paul, if I could just interject. Are we, is there any time limits on either of these public comment periods? Three minutes um, for each speaker. I mean, total, but um, we're just gonna go till it's exhausted. I, I would rather go till it's exhausted and everybody feels like they at, at least have spoken um, for the single time uh, and had their three minutes. Okay, just yep. wanted, uh, thanks. Uh, okay, our first public comment, Lori McCullough. Hello, and thank you to everyone who's been doing this hard work of thinking about how to teach kids in a pandemic. Um, I will try to be as brief as possible. I want to urge the school committee to um, start with full remote teaching. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, I think it's important that the teachers and the students uh, become familiar with remote teaching and the schedule and the expectations as soon as possible. Um, also, our numbers keep going up in Massachusetts and I, um, Personally, my child will not be going into the school, but I, I think to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem, we really, we really need to take advantage of remote teaching. The governor has asked people who can work remotely to work remotely, and we can work remotely here. Um, and we've learned a lot about kids transmitting this disease. We know that they're not immune. And certainly we have to think about the people that these kids go home to. I don't know about your about the situation in Hadley, but the school that I teach in, about 30% of the kids live with uh, grandparents or have grandparents taking care of them after school or on weekends. So it's, and that's consistently like every week. Um, so the, I think safety should be the priority. We, we can make up everything else, but we can't make up the loss of a beloved teacher or a child. Um, and so I want to talk just for a minute about the hybrid model, which um, I think I think we're, we're pushing for a hybrid model. Um, we, we all have to have one to submit to the state. Um, it is not as glorious as people might hope for. Uh, being in a class, and also I'm going to ask that we really, really hold to six feet and not let ourselves get um, 
feeling comfortable that three feet is okay because that's not what the CDC says. That's what Desi says. And Desi is trying to get kids in classrooms. Um, so the, the problem with the hybrid model is that you're still infecting everybody. It's just uh, not everybody on Tuesday. It'll be Tuesday and then Thursday. If there's a, if there's a contaminant in the school, it's, those teachers are still in the building every single day. Um, little kids, cannot read your face through a mask, that you cannot hear a story through a mask. If you have half of your first grade class in front of you and the, you cannot touch them, you cannot be with them the way that makes teaching successful face-to-face. -face. So the hybrid model, I think, is um, uh, it's just not everything it's cracked up to be. And I will tell you that in the, in the spring, I wanted to see my kids desperately, but not under these circumstances. I think it's much better to have face-to-face -face where you can read a person's face and understand everything they say. Then, and then there's also the factor of little kids being scared. We're gonna look like doctors in those classrooms. And I don't think that's good teach. I don't think that's what anybody wants. Also, you can put all the rules you want to in place for teenagers to stay away from each other. And that's not going to happen. We have evidence of that all over the country where teenagers and college students and grown-ups don't stay apart. So it's folly to expect that of kids in high school who haven't seen their friends since March. Um, I'm so sorry. That is three minutes. Okay. I just want to let Heather know. So I'm sorry, just a little over three minutes and perhaps I Heather will return to people. I think I said what I needed to say. Thank you, Laurie. Appreciate uh, it. Just the timer. <laughs> for, for folks who have just joined us, because I see we're up to 88 participants, we are in our first public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please raise your digital hand. Uh, some of the names on this meeting, I'm unable to see a name. It just says iPhone or um, a number. So I just want to make sure uh, that you have an opportunity to speak if you would like to during public comment. Also, there is a dial-in participant. The last four digits show as 7713. If you would like to make a public comment, please unmute yourself and um, you may participate in this public comment. Okay, um, seeing none, I am going to respect folks' time and keep moving through the agenda, and we will come back to our second public comment after item 4A, which is um, the review and discussion of fall reopening plans. Annie, I'll turn it over to you. Certainly. So first of all, I'd like to thank, as uh, Heather did, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, to thank everyone in the community again, and our faculty and staff who have been so helpful with their feedback and input and comments. And thank you, Heather, for doing a lion's share of reformatting and editing on the existing plan. The, the plan, it's still draft until approved by the school committee, is on the district website. Um, as soon as you log on to the district website, you can access the plan if you're looking for it. So I will begin. The purpose of this period is not to go through each plan in detail again. We did that last Thursday. But what we have done is organized this meeting to address each one of the issues that was brought up last Thursday. Um, but before we get to that, I'm going to ask Mr. Pfeiffer, Paul Pfeiffer, to talk a little bit about our most recent survey that we sent to families and some of the results that we saw in that survey. Great, Annie. Are you gonna, can you pull it up? I most certainly can. Actually, the one that I have for sharing, give me one second, Paul. I sure. apologize for that. Uh, the link that I have for sharing, I have to find... I'll just preface it. So I, I think we had a total of, so this is the second survey that went out July 31st. There was a previous survey, July 17th. We gave an over, overview of that in the last uh, school committee meeting. This one had fewer questions and got a little, and we presented, well, present the data just a little bit differently. There's only two, two tables, but uh, really trying to get down. Last time we presented the information based on family. This time we, we present the information based on number of students. So we had 263 responders, so 263 different families. 
um, and just breaking it up by the elementary school and uh, Hopkins. Asking essentially two big questions for the two big questions that we'll present here. So one is if, based on what you know now, what are you thinking about having your child attend the school? What are your plans? So really those falls into fall categories for each school. Yes, in person, not sure, but leaning in person, not sure leaning remote or remote. And so as you can see here, mirrors very much like what we had with the last uh, survey. But this one again, broken down not by number, by families, but by students. There's still a large percentage of um, students from these responders, and, and granted this is not the complete school because not everybody responded. Um, of those people who responded, those 263 families that responded, we have uh, a large majority saying they wanna send their child in person, so 54%. That's the average across both schools. You can see it broken down by the elementary and, and Hopkins. You have 23% as an average across the two schools of leaning towards in person, 8% leaning remote, and 16% um, remote. That's a total of for capturing almost 400 students, which is a large majority of our students. And then the other thing we said are if you are planning on sending your child, would you send them, or considering, would you send them on bus or not? And 60 for the elementary, 57 for Hopkins said bus, and then um, some portion unsure. So the big takeaway I see, right, is that there's a large percentage of the uh, parents uh, that are saying they're gonna send their students, their, ch their children in person or leaning towards in person. Combined, that's a 77% either wanting to send them in person or leaning towards in person. Anything else we wanna bring out from that information, Annie? No, I think, um, I think that we are all set with that. And we did notice in the range of comments that there's certainly, uh, I will talk about a couple of the comments. Um, there was a respondent in the comments concerned about three feet of physical distance at Hopkins Academy. I don't think we were clear um, uh, last week that in the cohort model, students are physically distanced at six feet apart. There were questions regarding remote learning, even in the survey as well as last week. The principals will be reviewing um, their uh, updated remote learning plans. And there were questions, there was one question in the survey about protocols for symptomatic people. Um, we will also show where you can find those in the plan. Um, so those were just the additional comments. I had one oh, additional yeah. comment I just wanted to make. Humera, you had asked a question last time about a difference between uh, folks who send um, children to one of each building, right? They have a child at elementary and a child at Hopkins that they might be less um, inclined to send their children back in person. I did have a couple folks reach out to me saying that really what it is, is it's two buildings and it's to, in their mind, double exposure um, and to whatever that is. So we've, we're talking about reducing risk and we're talking about all of the protocol within the buildings, but they see it as two different environments and because of that, they don't want to multiply the single environment <clears throat> that somebody like, you know, me might have with only having a child at Hopkins. I don't blame them. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that from the last meeting. Thank Thanks. you. And also the Hadley Education Association sent a second survey out to its members. And 75% um, of the members responded and the results of that survey indicated that 63% of the members would be more comfortable in a remote learning plan. Um, the ATA Board of Directors uh, recognizes and acknowledge that people certainly um, do feel that 63% of people do feel more comfortable in a remote learning environment. And they also recognize, even for themselves, what a challenging decision it is. They recognize how important school is and um, what a challenging decision that it is. And the preference doesn't necessarily take into account many of the other factors that might be relevant to making this kind of decision. But again, 63% of the 75% of the respondents of the Hadley Education Association indicated that they would, if they were to uh, choose, their preference would be a remote learning plan. And that also mirrors, if you listen to NPR this morning, 
data nationwide in uh, public ed educators nationwide, with about two thirds of public educators saying that they would feel more comfortable with remote teaching. Hey, and then, yeah. You know, just a detail on that. So that 63% remote learning is uh, specifically related to the plan we have been discussing and proposing? No, that I do not know. So let me be clear is that I was, the information was shared with me in the aggregate. This was a survey that was disseminated by the HEA board to the HEA. I did not see individual survey responses. I did not even see some sort of aggregate capture. It was just a description of the aggregate results that I was given. So I see Mr. Burns has given the thumbs up, but that is okay. what it was referencing. Yeah. I assume so. So thank you, Jason. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Jason. Okay. And so something else that was not, um, I, I think, not entirely clear when we talked last week, and something I want to share with people is terribly small. I apologize for that, but I am going to attempt to share it nonetheless. Um, this is now in our plans. Let me see up here if I can get some. Uh, increased, no, I can't. Um, so we, we asked the question, um, we talked about our phases, if we were in person in an in-person cohort model, and we spent a lot of time describing the importance of moving through phases. I had explained to people who were on the call or the meeting last week that I was fortunate enough to speak with Dr. Allen, the principal investigator of the reducing risk in an in when reopening schools report from Harvard School of Public Health. He stressed the importance of phases being the equivalent of two virus cycles, so six weeks long. And um, I walked through with him what we thought we would change in each phase. And he didn't feel like it was too aggressive. But we didn't talk about the obvious is that um, if remote learning were a phase, if that were phase one, then what becomes phase two. Um, and I just wanna say that for people. So if remote learning were an initial phase, then everything we talked about in the cohort model, phase one of the cohort model then becomes phase two. I hope that makes sense and so forth. If, you, if we started with in-person cohort, that phase one is five days of shortened day, a tight cohort model, everything we described last week. But we were describing remote solely as something that stood apart, when in fact, it could very well be a phase, right? Whether, whether if, if public health data indicated that we were in a position to reopen schools in a way that we could reduce risk, and then something public health metrics uh, started to get progressively worse and we exceeded that five percent testing positivity rate we would go into a remote learning phase and then we would again before we came out of that remote learning phase we would say okay where do we what's the next logical place which is to return to that cohort model and um and resume our progression through the phases so I just wanted to provide that visual for people because I don't know that that was entirely clear or we described it that way. Annie, can I ask a question? This of course. Is so that, that's really helpful. So maybe just a little different nuance on that. So if we do start in the remote learning phase, mm -hmm. uh, and you had a six week window there, what epidemiological data would we use to determine when that phase would end and to shift into that other uh, in-person phase? So assuming, so assuming that um, the reason for going into a remote learning phase, the reason for being in remote learning is that um, there's evidence of, of active community trans transmission as evidenced by testing positivity rates for the county. I did hear from an epidemiologist at DPH last week, currently Hampshire County percent positivity rates are 1.5%. And I can pull up the date of that email. I do believe I forwarded it to the school committee, but it was just either this week or, or just last week. But if testing positivity rates were at um, 
5%. And I know that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is right now looking to also perhaps um, suggest metrics and phases, but I would say it's, it's pretty commonly accepted when we look at these maps. If you see above a 5% testing positivity rate, that's where you see states kind of in the, in the red. And states that are below 5% are in the green. And if we saw county data that was above 5%, then the question about when do we come back into phase one, I would say that you want your community transmission rates definitely below 5%. If you're asking me personally what I've been talking to people about, you want that below 5%. Um, and then is your next question then, okay, if that brought us into phase one, how do we decide to go to phase two? That's where you wanna see before you move out of any phase, you wanna see improvement, right? You wanna see things going down, or if they're at, if they're at uh, below 5%, you definitely don't wanna, you wanna be maintaining or improving, right? That that rate's going down before you start progressing through additional phases. Because in each additional phase, I'll say again, you're not reducing restriction, but you are allowing for increased movement. So in each of our phases, we introduce one day of group mixing. And the first speaker in public comment was making very astute comments about the issues with hybrid, right? So hybrid introduces mixed groups right from the beginning. And we do that very, very slowly and only after a phase. Did that answer your question, Paul, about how it would play out? Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks, Annie. Um, so now there was a lot of questions for good reason and a lot of feedback on the remote learning plan for each one of the schools. So just to set the stage for this, I just want to let folks in the audience know, either who are watching or who are, or I guess we're all watching now, we're not together anymore, um, or who watch this later, or watch a recording later, that we are still developing these details. And there's a very good reason for that. Although we have had um, very helpful and excellent teacher input, and in some cases, just these represent a lot of teacher development, teacher developed plans, or in some cases, input from teachers. So we have developed these in collaboration with teachers, but Mass General Law 150E is very clear. An employer, in this case a school committee, may not unilaterally change working conditions for an employee who's protected by MGL 150E. So remote teaching or hybrid teaching or any of this is, um, represents changes in working conditions. And so we are working with the Hadley Education Association to make sure we have a clear and mutually agreed upon memorandum of understanding. Um, so we're still fleshing these things out. And that's even important to note that when the school committee votes to approve a plan to present to the state, everything is always contingent upon uh, that mutually agreed upon memorandum of understanding. So we've made a lot of progress on these, but I just need people to understand that by law, these things must be negotiated. So I'm gonna have April start with the Hopkins Academy remote plan. And if you'd like April, I am happy to share that screen at that point. That would be, thank you, Annie. Sure. Um, hello, everyone who's, who's come tonight. Thank you all for being here. I'd also like to thank the faculty and staff, school committee members, parents and students for all their contributions and their patience during this very challenging process. Um, it's been an interesting summer for sure. So we have looked at remote learning and uh, as was just shared, we can sort of share some of what the student perspective would be for that. You can see in the plan here too, that it does look a little bit different from last week. So it's formatted a little bit more like a narrative. There are also some sample schedules on pages three through five, both for students and then also just to kind of get an idea of what, um, if there was synchronous time during 100% remote, what that might look like. So again, these are all just samples and not sort of set in stone. So that you can kind of see those at the end. Um, in general, when we're talking about remote learning, and actually not just for remote, right, but for all students, we're going to be using Google Classroom. So all students will use Google Classroom throughout the year, no matter what. If they're remote, if they're in person. 
um, but certainly if they're remote, that's the platform that they're going to be using. Um, through that, students will also obviously be using their other Google apps as well and checking their email daily. Their curriculum and instructional materials will all be on that Google Classroom and they will come from their teacher. A lot of that will be asynchronous, right? So they'll have materials and assessments, feedback that they can access. Um, again, we are having them follow whatever the school day is at the time. So I just say that because depending on which plan, there are some different schedules and slightly different times. So whichever it is, is what they would be following. We are also um, looking at some synchronous time for students provided by staff or educators. And they would, they would have their attendance tracked. So in the spring, uh, that was not as concrete, but this year for remote students, attendance and grading are exactly the same. So the methods of doing both of those things, the weighting of both of those, um, in terms of attendance, right, if a child is sick, you still have to call the school and tell the school that they're sick. That's an excused absence. If you're looking at an exempted absence, you still have to follow all of those protocols. So all of those things are exactly the same. Um, Dusty's made it very clear that that has to be the case. And then um, there will also be some opportunities for remote learners um, and the in-person learners to engage through some group work and collaboration as well. So it, those group assignments can happen kind of no matter where somebody is, so that we have those connections in the classroom. Um, thinking about, can you go to the, the draft support schedule for a second? I sure can. You should probably add it. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't add exactly. it to this document. So this is a draft, um, which is also subject to negotiation, of course. Um, but this would just sort, sort of help people kind of visualize what some of that synchronous time might look like. Um, and so here you can see that there are some alternating days and subjects supported by different staff members. Those aren't assigned to particular people at this time. This is just a draft, has to go through negotiations, and then we would identify those people for those types of roles. So this is just to give people an idea of where and how that synchronous time might happen. And this would be for the remote students only. So this wouldn't be for the students um, if we're in person that have the in-person contact. This is just for remote students. Um, I think that might be it for the updated plan. Sorry, I'm trying to remember uh, just the student perspective and not, not the other. <laughs> the other details for now, but I think that is all for now, and I can pass it along to Jen Dowd. <laughs> thank you, April. Um, and again, I wanna thank my, um, I'm Jennifer Dowd, for those of you who don't know, I'm the principal at Hadley Elementary School. Um, I would like to start off by, again, thanking my faculty, my staff, um, my support staff, from home <laughs> and uh, Dr. McKenzie and also the school committee. This has been a lot of work. I know we did not anticipate to um, decide on a plan this evening, but I'm, I'm slightly relieved that we might be pinpointing where, what direction we're going to be going in given that there's so much organization and planning that needs to be done. I don't envy the school committee and their decision this evening. I know it's very difficult. Um, I can't imagine. Um, taking into everybody's point of view and consideration and, and students and families. I know um, it's just not an easy task to decide. And I know that school districts across um, the Commonwealth are making the same decisions. And, um, but I'm very proud of the team that I'm working with. And I, in particular, would like to thank uh, Mr. Driver, Ms. Jolinas, Ms. Corvo, and Ms. Parker, who helped me today tighten up our remote plan. So Dr. McKenzie, if you wouldn't mind, could you please um, share our remote learning plan? Mm -hmm. There it is. And again, we really worked on, when we were thinking about our remote plan, we were anticipating the students that will be, that would be remote regardless. So if we went with an in-person model, we know that there are some families, given our family survey, that there will be children that will be accessing our remote plan it will look a little bit different, but it will still have same components if we were to go 100% remote. So here is the summary. Um, there was a section that's um, added in for student services. It's very important to consider also our special needs population and what kind of supports that they will be needing. Types of modifications for their specific programs. Um, but it's very important if you wanna go up to um, 
the HES student, I'm sorry, uh, HES student, go down a little bit. Thank you, Dr. McKenzie. <laughs> student expectations. So regardless if you are, um, if you are remote during our in-person, you would still have the expectations if we were 100% remote, which would be that students are expected to check their Google Classroom. To Ms. Camuso's point, this is not going to be the same as it was in the spring where we were all trying to scramble and, and take attendance and, and take account of families. Um, this is gonna be a, an organized effort with our staff and with our teaching staff so that attendance will be taken. If you are remote, that will count. Students will be expected to get onto Google Classroom where their assignments will be uploaded by teachers every day. Um, and our platform will be Google Classroom, although there is some co um, conversations happening right now with our youngest kindergarten, preschool, kindergarten, and what platforms would work for them. Um, so there will be additional work that will be needed to be considered for our youngest learners. We know there's a big difference between, I say it all the time, our five-year-olds and our fifth graders and what they can do independently for work. So we really wanna make sure that we're using platforms that are um, don't exceed a lot of screen, screen time, um, but are, that you are user-friendly for families. So when we talk about our, um, actually, if you would scroll up a little bit, Annie. There we go. Grading and assessments. This is something that I also want to make families be fully aware of. Again, it's not going to be in the spring where we have the credit, no credit system. We will be um, using our, our standards-based report card and we'll be making sure that grading will be laid out um, for families so that they understand what assignments will be counted. We are working right now. Our team had a really wonderful discussion about one, what synchronous times could we offer families if, for instance, we were in person and there were a, a percentage of children that were home um, who were accessing the remote Google Classroom? So what kind of synchronous times could we possibly offer during the school day? We know that we'll have some time at the end of the day to touch base with families, but really when they get up in the morning and they're home, what kind of resources can they access and how can they virtually climb into somebody's classroom, their own classroom, and have some interactions with their peers and also the classroom teacher. So we're still having conversations about that. There are some points that need to be negotiated as Annie um, and, and April uh, alluded to. So we wanna make sure that we're still having those conversations. Attendance, again, will be completely taken, whether you're remote or in person. We did a summary of family and family expectations for in-person and remote students. If we were to go 100% remote, obviously, they, these would still be the expectations. Making sure that you touch base with your teachers every day, attendance, making sure that in grades four through six, students will have their own email addresses. So making sure that students are accessing teachers through their own email um, and just making sure that the Google Classroom work is completed. We will have dates for work to be done that we'll need to adhere to. Um, students will have to do that. And then participation for art, music, and PE, which we have scheduled for the end of the day. Dr. McKenzie, if you could scroll down to our sample schedule. So we worked on this, um, Ms. Jelinas um, had put this in grade four. We thought that was a, a good grade to start at considering it's kind of in the middle between kindergarten and, and our older students. So as you can see, this would be a remote plan. Again, this is just a draft. We just started working on it, but you can see it sticks to our typical school day. Embedded in this, there are also additional times for support staff, meaning other identified staff members that can check in with students. So if we had an in-person model going, we know that the classroom teacher is busy teaching. Who else could we get to be live with our students that are remote learning? And so here is a draft schedule. And you can see there are blocks of time, days of weeks, the grade levels, and then the staff. Staff ABC, that would be people. So Staff member A would check in with kindergarten around English language arts from 8.30 to 9.15. We thought 45 minute blocks would be helpful um, considering it takes a while for people to log in. And my favorite phrase, you're on mute. 
um, making sure <laughs> that families can sit next to their children and get on with the, with the identified staff member. Um, again, this could shift given enrollment numbers, given what kind of available staff we have, but I think this is a good starting point. And this will be in, in also in addition to teachers, if we were to go 100% remote, this would be a support system for teachers as well. So I think that's a good model. That's what we've come up with so far. Again, I do not envy the decision of the school committee, um, but I wanna thank my faculty and my staff for, for just putting these plans together. And I'm of course always open um, to feedback and I will be, I'm sure, having many, many conversations in the weeks to come. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. And we also uh, have been having conversations about the kinds of professional development that we will make available for faculty, Ms. Camuso and I both uh, did some work with the Global Online Alliance this week and they, they, their primary focus is helping educators and leaders um, do high quality work in online learning environments. And we recognize that actually when I say that, that online is a platform, it is not a pedagogy, and that it's important that we invest in enhancing our ability, um, our collective ability to deliver really high quality instruction in virtual environments. Another topic that came up last week was about airflow. And so, Paul, I'm wondering if you'd like to speak about what where we're at with some of our HVAC work and our good news from the town last night. Yeah, maybe I'll start there. Um, yeah, big thank you to the town uh, select board, um, Chief Spake Nabel, uh, and David Nixon, the town manager. Through conversations that Andy and I had, uh, the town select board approved uh, us spending up to about a little over $223,000 for uh, supplies needed to for personal protective gear, for tents, additional desks, for uh, air purifiers in the room, and for uh, repairing, cleaning our HVAC system in both schools. So that's CARES Act money, so it's federally designated money. Uh, so just again, thank you to the select board. So that gave us the ability now to go forward. We're looking at purchasing air purifiers uh, for every room. Uh, some of the bigger rooms will have more than one air purifier. So there's a balance with air purifiers, right, of um, noise versus uh, efficacy. And um, there's also just like, there's not clear guidance from EPA or CDC or really, really anybody out there about how many air changes per hour is what's required. But I will say the air purifiers are not our main way to exchange air, right? That's going to be through the existing HVAC system, hence the need to make sure it's, they're functioning as well as possible. So we've got TJ Conway that's gonna be starting soon to go and start repairing and cleaning all the systems. And each of the schools um, have univents that pull in outside air. And so those dampers will be opened up so that you're really trying to maximize external air into, into the uh, inside spaces. We'll buy fans for each of the rooms to pull in outside air. So hopefully we have a, a pleasant fall and we can use those as long as possible if we're back in school. Uh, they'll go up on the roof and they'll fix the systems up there. So everything will be running as efficiently as it can be. Uh, and there's been some talk about the gym and cafeteria spaces. Those are spaces that are just too large, right, to purify with portable air purifiers. This is not going to work. But the benefit you have with a uh, place like the gym, and, and Principal Dowd and I were there looking at this in, in the elementary school today, is you have, that has a different uh, ventilation system and it pulls directly from outside. And so they're actually gonna get really robust uh, exchange of outside air into their system. We don't know exactly what, we'll, we'll, we'll get better information once we talk to the HVAC folks that, that come in next week. But that system up there is just, is, in both schools uh, for the gym is, is very robust and draws directly from external air. So that'll actually be some of the best air exchanges in uh, the school. So that's where we stand, you know, as with anything right now, uh, air purifiers are sort of the new toilet paper. So there's uh, the issue now is getting them ordered in time and getting them delivered in time. But we're working hard on that. And thanks again, you know, once the select board gave the green light last night, I started working uh, to look to place an order as soon as we can. Great, thank you so much, Paul. May I ask a quick clarifying question? 
Sure. Uh, these portable air purifiers, are they, um, are they about equivalent to or uh, less capable than or more capable than, say, the air purifiers that a hospital like Bay State would have? They're the same. I mean, they're all HEPA related. So if you go the, the minimum air efficiency standard, the MERV, right? HEPA is its own designation. So the, what you get difference is the, any sort of the pre-filtering, the charcoal, whether there's ionization, and then the, the draw strength of the fan. And the higher the draw strength of the fan, usually the more noise, right? But the HEPA filter is essentially the same standard. So what you're getting at, they talk about MERV 13 as the minimum to, to capture the droplets for the virus get down to, you know, 0.3 microns. Um, MERV uh, is not 13, it's, it's upwards of 16 to 17. I've heard different, I've read different things. So it's a really high rate. The, what, what you get is how many times is it changing the air in the room, right? And so kind of a rule of thumb that I've, I've seen from the literature is you, you're shooting for through these portable air filters. Again, it's not the only way to exchange air because we're going to rely mainly on outside air through the inner vents and fans. But we'd want the, I'm planning for the air filters alone, if they were in a locked room with no external air, to change the, the air uh, twice an hour. Again, that's lower than we want, but they're not never gonna be acting alone. They'll be in combination with the HVAC and on other days, uh, um, fans. And then I will say too, each of the schools will have three tents. That was something else the select board approved uh, permission. Those have already been ordered. So you'll have three tents that are outside where the kids can on nice days study. They can get mask breaks. Um, so those are going to be important. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for all of your work on that. Sure. And another question that came up last Thursday, again, we are going through some of the issues that were raised last Thursday when we initially discussed some of these plans. So one question, I believe, Tara, you had asked the question, um, when, when, we move, if, when we move into phase two in the in-person cohort model, we have one full day, and in that one full day of regular schedule, we would go, if 100% of students are present, six feet, there would be six feet in some spaces, and in some spaces, it would be a meter, and in some spaces, it would be between one meter and six feet. Tara, you had asked, is it possible for us to have both, to allow a day of mixed groups to follow a regular schedule and still maintain the six feet. So Ms. Camuso analyzed that, and if you would like, April, you can speak to that and I can share the, um, your analysis of that. Sure, thanks. Sure. Yeah, so it's a great question. Obviously, it's a challenge. So I wanted to go through our district problem solving process to try to think about that and identify what the problem was, right, which is the idea that uh, less than six feet is concerning potentially for health and safety reasons. And we wanted to try to increase that so that we didn't have mixing and having students closer in proximity. So I took a look at some of our different pieces. That's what you see under the problem analysis there and trying to think about why it was, right, that we had that original 46% um, at six feet and then 54% were less than six feet. In the original um, three foot plan, only 11% are at three feet. Everything is more than, than three feet apart, but again, it varies in that middle sort of window uh, between that and six feet. So looking at it, of course, in the middle school and high school, students take a variety of different courses. And so our class sizes really vary quite greatly. So you could have two students in one class and 28 students in another class and 43 students in band and 15 students in history. And so it just really changes a lot. In general though, at six feet, the majority of our classes can only hold 12 students. And we were looking at our, our number of classes um, where you can see where I had a quantity of large large classes in a regular year they're not all they're not all large right 14 15 is still a nice number but the majority of our classes we're going to have 13 or more students or we had 59 alone with 19 or more students and so thinking about that in general we had the need for 103 classes um, to fit into just these, these few rooms and so that in and of itself doesn't work as is, right? So we can't move all the students to six feet apart and have them all there at once and teach them all of those classes. 
Uh, so what I did do, though, was go back and look at it again and say, well, can I get closer, right? Because that was the question, like, how close can we get? So when I first sort of established the room assignments, in addition to thinking about the size of the space, there was also a few extra considerations in thinking about teacher movement, right? Teachers, uh, for some safety concerns, didn't want to have to move to a variety of different classes and share a variety of different spaces. Um, there's also just thinking about the access to resources in a classroom. So I was trying to think very specifically about science teachers and lab spaces and making sure that they had access to those materials and things that they would likely need. And so to get the, the space, um, to increase the space, I didn't worry about those things, right? So I just looked at the number of students that we have in a class the spaces that fit them. I went back through the beginning and reassigned those rooms, uh, which I think the room assignment sheet is now a public document, I think, as well. Um, but I reassigned them all. And of course, I, I should note, too, that there are always some minor schedule changes that happen if kids come into the district, kids who email me, as they have been over the summer, to say, well, I think I really like to take this instead. And so I'm keeping an eye on that as best I can. But based on these current numbers, this is kind of where we're at. So in reassigning them and not paying much attention anymore to how many people move, where they move, what resources they want in their room, we were able to eliminate the three foot or the meter. So 0% of classes in that new room assignment sheet are at that distance. All classes are either a meter to six feet, 41% of them, and 59% are at six feet or more. So that is obviously an improvement. Um, again, on, on the downside, teachers have to move and share spaces more often. We have more classrooms. That was the other thing I tried to really maintain classes in the classroom rather than moving to them to the larger spaces. Uh, so in this instance, we had to use the gym and the cafeteria much more often in the band room and the library than in the original plan. Uh, and some classes might not have the lab equipment that they would normally have either. So I had to move people around. Um, there was a second idea or intervention. So another way to do it might be to consider instead of in phase two, moving into the three foot in person where it mixes, it might be using a hybrid model instead, right? So in doing so, you kind of maintain those classroom assignments, but we're reducing the number of kids. So we have the movement, but we should still have that six feet. Now, I don't have that full schedule still. I haven't divided them all. That's the one where we divide them all by their English classes, and then I count it all, and that's uh, a process by hand. Um, so that still needs to be done. I've done a, a partial sample of uh, juniors and seniors for that, which is in the hybrid plan currently. Um, so in that one, right, so some challenges. Not all students attend school on the same day. We'd have to think about, do we do this two days a week so that everybody gets it or do we just still do it one day a week and they alternate like cohort A does it Monday of week one and cohort B does it Monday of week two. That could be, that may or may not cause problems in transportation or with childcare with HES. It wouldn't be the same schedule as them necessarily, uh, but it would still be a full day. So that piece would be similar. And then the third idea that I looked at was sort of the tightest idea was that instead of moving out of the cohort, right? If, if phase two feels like too much too fast, Instead of moving out of the cohort, you leave kids in the cohort, but you move teachers. Now, again, because students are in specific classes, when we move teachers, you aren't going to have them moving to teach their class. That wouldn't necessarily work because they're all in different classes all the time. But you could end up having teachers at least access more of their students, especially if they're in uh, seventh grade, they're, they're all with their grade level teachers. Um, and you, you could at least get more discipline specific support. So again, it wouldn't be an ideal match. You wouldn't suddenly have your class with you, but you would see a new teacher interact with a new person and get a new discipline support. Um, so those are kind of the, the three ideas that I could come up with for some variations in how to move through the phases besides our original proposal that uh, I just wanted to share with you guys. And if anyone has anyone else, I also welcome that. But those, those are the three that I came up with for now. Great. Thank you so much, April. And um, another question that came up last week was um, around fifth grade. There were some uh, questions around fifth grade in that learning space. And uh, Ben, I don't know if you'd like to make a few comments about that. I know you've been in communication with parents, but I also recognize yeah. that it came up last week. 
Yes, and um, I was grateful for Paul to come and visit me today at HES. We were able to walk through the space and, and look at the ventilation system, um, which made me feel a lot better. And I wanna thank Paul for, for coming to visit me. We got to look at some other classrooms. Um, I know that fifth grade um, has a lot of concerns about being in the gym. They're the only class that would be in that space. All the other classrooms are in traditional classroom spaces. Um, I, I hear the families. I, I've lost a lot of sleep over these decisions about where to move people. Um, I recognize that that group um, of students has a lot of energy and a lot of spirit. And so I know that the gym is not an optimal learning environment for them. So with that being said, uh, we still know that there will be a percentage of families that will choose remote, which will decrease our numbers. And I have made the commitment to my fifth grade families that my first priority is to move them into more traditional spaces. I also have the additional spaces of the cafe, again, not an optimal learning environment, um, but I also have the music room. I have additional spaces that I might be able to make adjustments to our classroom schedules. Um, but as of right now, it's really hard to make that decision. It was, we have two very large classrooms of 40, for first graders and fifth graders, or both at 40. Um, and I don't think anybody would wanna see the first grade in the gym, <laughs> um, just given their age. I think fifth graders might be a little bit more apt to be able to sit in that space. But again, it's a commitment of mine. To, once I get final numbers, whatever direction the school committee goes in, I will be able to pivot and, and hopefully make a, a building plan where those students will be in more traditional classrooms. Thank you, Jen. And I will be meeting with grade five families. I wanted to meet with them this week, but then this meeting agenda changed a little bit. So I did email every single family. I got some nice responses um, and I will be meeting with them hopefully next week. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Last week, uh, the question about medical waiting rooms also came up. So they are in the, in the school specific plans that you can link to the district plan and the district plan refers to it on page 19. But I will say that our medical waiting, waiting rooms or the COVID waiting rooms, our school nurses identified spaces, um, a separate room within their office or a separate room within the building um, that has access um, to, um, in the case of Hopkins, that we'll have a dedicated restroom for it um, and um, a space that students can easily get to that room. Um, so the nurses looked at these rooms, the nurses identified spaces and um, information about them is in each of the school plans. Um, there were questions last week about room assignments and supervision. And I think mostly this was around um, HES, so again, um, finalizing the supervision for overflow rooms. We're having conversations with our faculty and staff about that. The teacher of record is responsible for instruction and um, this support staff that assists with supervision is working under the direction of the classroom teacher. The number of overflow spaces will be determined that we need and therefore the amount of supervision that we need will be determined by the number of if we are in person, it will be determined by the number of students we have in person. When Ms. Dowd created the plan for Hadley Elementary School, she had to assume, because 100% of families have access when school is open, they have access to school, we planned assuming that 100% of students would be present. But as you saw just from the most recent family survey, that is very unlikely to be the case. And so, some of that supervision as well as the need for and location of overflow spaces is very, will very likely change. I don't think as many of the questions pertain to Hopkins Academy, but certainly within the plan, um, within the plans, uh, Ms. Camusa has very detailed information in her school plan that uh, delineates supervision and classroom assignments. Uh, there was a question about strategic use of volunteers and if we considered inviting parents to assist hey, us. I, I'm sorry, yep. Sorry, I just interrupted about the, uh, the segregated rooms, sort of the, the nurses' mm -hmm. room and the wellness rooms. Um, those will have oversized air purifiers, and specifically because um, 
they're, they're smaller rooms and we know what they'll be used for. So the, their air change rate due just strictly to air purifiers will be increased. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. No, I'm glad you did because as you can tell, I'm making sure I tackle everything that was brought up last week. So thank you, many parents have reached out. Parents have been helpful even before uh, we've gotten to the fall in so many ways. Thank you for the parents who have stepped up to help us think through air and air exchange rates and how we improve uh, the HVAC systems. Several parents who work as medical professionals have reached out directly to me and to our nurses. They have already contributed in so many ways and their contributions have been invaluable. Next year, our starting policy is to be as strict as possible with visitors. Uh, we are working with some colleges who will still be placing student teachers. Um, those colleges like UMass and Westfield State are extremely strict about the training that they take those student teachers through. Um, and they're also, if we were to have any student teachers, the observation piece, so usually colleges have a professor come in and observe the student teacher on site they won't, they're going to minimize those kinds of visits. These things will be done remotely. So they're really working hard to minimize anybody who would be entering our school buildings. But the good news about that is that if we were to have some student teachers, that will also uh, be a great help for us in terms of working with students and supervising students. And we will continue to reach out to parents and ask for very specific kinds of help if parents are interested and willing to help us. There was a question last week about what do we do if a student, if a cohort isn't a good mix and a student is really struggling with his or her peers, with their peers. So um, that, if an issue like that were to arise, a parent should reach out directly to, well, I would suggest the parent, if the parent feels as though their child is having an issue in a class, always, always start with the classroom teacher. And the parent and the classroom teacher can certainly have a conversation with the principal. And if there's a recommendation to make some sort of change, we would need to be very, very careful because we have, we've worked, we're working so hard in these initial phases. When we determine that it's time to introduce in-person learning, we are working so hard to have tightly controlled uh, cohorts in phase one that we really don't want to do a lot of mixing if we can avoid it. But um, certainly if there was an issue, a parent could start with their classroom teacher always. And then um, if needed, the classroom teacher and the parent can, can talk with the principal. There were questions about social and emotional learning and how are we going to support students in that way. Pam Haywood, the Director of Student Services, is working with the behavioral health team, our school psychologists, our counselors, um, our behavioral health support staff to think through um, the kinds of social and emotional supports and learning that uh, we should focus on next year. We are grateful that we will have 11 days with our teachers and professionals prior to students returning. And we anticipate um, that this team will work with our faculty and staff around supporting the social and emotional needs of students. And there were several comments in the survey and last week, questions about after school. I've been in touch with Sarah Frost, the program leader for Hadley Kids. And if we are in person, she has done a wonderful job of identifying um, the students who are currently registered and um, what grades those students are in. And in, we would do everything in our power. I mean, optimally, some of those kids might be in a similar cohort during the day, but certainly in after school, they would and the groups are very small, they would remain um, in very small groups, six feet of physical distancing, access to tents outside, um, and, and one adult to supervise each one of these very small cohorts um, of, or small groups of students um, that are um, the largest group has 12 students in it, and then a smaller group has six students in it. We could offer after school from when school dismisses until the end of the day. Um, I would estimate that the increase in cost, the after care program is 
roughly $5.50 an hour, roughly, although it's a flat daily rate. So the increase, we're looking to, to be able to offer families the option of just needing that until the end of what, to roughly, let's say about 3.30 in the afternoon, or to pay an additional amount and go to the traditional 5.30 in the afternoon. So um, if we are in person, uh, we believe we will be able to offer an after school program. And I think that those were all of the comments from last week and questions, the things we were charged with kind of addressing before we came back here this Thursday. So certainly I turn the meeting back over to you, Heather. Thanks, Annie. Um, and thank you very much, April and Jennifer, for going through uh, the plans and Paul for uh, the air quality and the work that you've been doing on that. Um, so just a reminder for folks, we're going to now do another public comment, another round, same rules, um, same process. Uh, and again, this gives us an opportunity um, one more time to hear from folks. You just need to raise your digital hand and I'll call on you. Um, and then we will go into, um, we'll discuss as a committee and deliberate around this topic. Uh, so with that, I'll call on Nancy Sharp, your first um, public comment. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for doing this in such an open forum. Um, I wanna thank all the administrators, all the staff and teachers that have helped put these plans together. Um, and I have two major concerns. Um, I've had the good opportunity to um, speak with Dr. McKenzie about some of these concerns, uh, but wanted to address the whole committee. My first concern is that the data that we're making decisions is really based on today, the here and now. And I know we have no other data to go by, but we do know that approximately 10,000 students will re-enter the Valley, um, 7,000 in the UMass campus and 3,000 or more in the other five college locations. And my concern is that, you know, people come from everywhere. They come from other, uh, communities, other regions that have much higher COVID numbers. And I guess my preference would be to start remotely, look at the numbers, and then make a much better educated decision about did this impact us or not? Maybe we'll be fortunate and there won't be an increase because of their testing as they enter campus. But I do believe if we look at other states and other models, whether it be Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, that some of that movement is part of the cause of their outbreaks. Um, so that's one concern. And then the second that I talked to Dr. McKenzie is about the fact that we have other at-risk populations of staff. Um, fortunately, I have no underlying condition, but I'm over 60 years old, and that alone puts me at risk. Um, we have children at risk for a variety of medical reasons, we have children going home, as we've talked about, to grandparents and aunts and neighbors. Um, and I just would very much not want to undo all the hard work that we did in the spring. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nancy. Appreciate it. Okay, our next public comment is uh, Tony Lynn Morelli. Thanks, Heather. Thanks to uh, Dr. McKenzie and Ms. Dowd and the whole school committee. Um, this is all really nerve wracking for all of us and I really feel like you're just making it clear that you really care and are doing um, all the good thinking. And I echo Ms. Dowd that I'm really glad I don't have to make the decision. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, I hear all the concerns. My sister's a teacher, I, I totally hear these. I um, also just worry like the American Association, American Academy of Pediatrics um, statement that kids should go back to school really made an impression on me. And I'm really heartened to see in the plan that there's a lot of attention on special needs students because I know that there are students that really need to be back and get um, in-person um, attention. So I'm happy to see that in there and I want to make sure that remains part of the conversation because even if it's a small per percentage of our community, it's really important. Um, and that's a big reason why I feel like 
conflicted about staying remote versus going in person. So I'm glad to hear that that is getting a lot of attention. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Emily Pfeiffer. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll echo everybody's thanks and use fewer words to say it, but I'm appreciative as well. Um, we've had a lot of stats, right? And, and we're looking at this kind of moment in time with the statistics. Um, and that 5% positivity rate, that's, I feel like it's just scary to look at that in a vacuum to say we're not there yet and, and to perceive that as, as safer. Uh, we have to watch the trends too. And I think it's important because we're seeing the numbers already going in that direction. Um, I think it was Nancy who was saying, you know, students are coming back. I think it's just sort of likely that the numbers will continue to go in the direction we don't like. And so it, it just seems like a really hard call to say that we would choose to knowingly continue to increase that risk rather than doing what we can to keep them going in the other direction. I know it's not the only consideration and I know it, it's really tough. Um, I wanted to add my voice to the call to open remotely, at least to start that way. Um, and if not, to prioritize continuing to clarify the remote experience and ensuring that it doesn't set students up for um, a less quality educational experience than the ones in person will receive. Uh, I see the, the schedules and things that have been added to the remote plan. I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around it. It looks like it's uh, a pretty scheduled um, first half of the day and then the kind of independent time in the afternoon, if, if I'm understanding it correctly, it makes sense to me. I don't see breaks in between, but I'm sure they'll sort of naturally happen as kids log in and out of their remote meetings or however it works. But it's, um, I just, I appreciate the movement that's happened there. I know it's a lot of work. I just, I look forward to more clarity about what that experience would look like and continue to implore us to start with remote at least. That's all, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Emily. Susan Bai, you are next for public comment. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask about, again, the if we do end up going remote learning to start, um, that the plans for um, the students to have actual like meetings with the teachers that are scheduled, that they would have to be there daily. Um, is that something that you're looking towards doing for remote uh, plans? Okay. Uh, I just had another question too and I lost it. <laughs> um, I, if I remember, I'll raise my hand again. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Susan. Yep. Uh, Dakota Lively. Hi. Um, so my name's actually Kristen. Dakota's my son. Um, Hi, Kristen. <laughs> I've done a lot of these Zoom meetings and stuff with him. And I understand where everyone's coming from. I'm a family child care provider. I just reopened three weeks ago. So I've had to go through all the set up and precautions and planning and stuff like that. And I, I totally understand where everyone's coming from. I know a lot of families as well as myself that have to work. I mean, I'm in a boat where I'm lucky I get to work from home, but I have other children here. My child does not do well with remote lo learning at all. I mean, he's going to be, he's going to be in kindergarten. Um, my concern is, is that if we do that remote learning in the beginning of the year, that he's going to miss so much that he needs. And he's missed a lot of it since school let out in March. Um, he is on an IEP. He gets services for speech, OT, um, and PT as well. And trying to accommodate doing those virtually for him is like trying to pull somebody's tooth with no Novocaine. It's just not possible. <laughs> um, and I understand and I am very grateful for everything that all of you are working so hard 
to do to make sure that our children are safe. Um, I just feel at least for the younger ones that, and for my child in particular, that trying to learn online isn't going to work for them. And for my son in particular. Um, and I'm just worried that he'll just fall too so far behind that he's not going to be able to catch up. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's really what I wanted to say. I get the safety concerns. I live in a multi-generational home. I have my son who has, you know, health, health issues. I myself has asthma. So I have that on top of it. Plus, uh, I live with my parents and then we also help take care of my grandparents who live next door. So, I mean, I get, we're doing everything we can on our end to keep them safe. But I, again, I mean, as much as I don't want to send my child back to school for those safety reasons, I feel like he won't learn academically if he's not back in an actual classroom. Thank you. Linda Lobel, uh, parent of Ethan Lobel. Hi, I just unmuted myself. Okay, um, three things and I'll be quick. One, I was asking if you could elaborate on the issues the children will face in holding classes outside in late fall and or having the windows open in the middle of the winter and, and the fall in the New England weather, that's one. And two, um, I agree with Nancy Sharp and Emily on the issue of you know who determines whether to use remote learning 100% and I was hoping you could define better who is the ultimate decision maker. Is it a single individual or who in the Hadley public school system actually provides input into what metrics and data will be used? Is it just the 5% infection rate in the county or how will the school handle or measure the infection rate within the schools between teachers and students and their families versus just a county meter or measure of data of, of infection rates? And is there any consideration given in the metrics for students, staff, and families who work or travel outside of Hampshire County? Third, I would ask that the school consider remote learning 100% as I think it would also aid in the emotional and social health of children who feel like they're missing out on something because their friends are in school and they're not. Um, so they don't feel like they're missing out on something with their friends and it would be a more unified approach. And it seems like the majority of some of the voting that I heard you talk about in the beginning about the staff was leaning toward that. And it, um, that's all. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, what, Amanda Kinchla. I'm sorry if I didn't say that. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Amanda Kinchla and um, like all of you, I want to appreciate your um, efforts in trying to build a plan. And I guess when I wanted to raise a concern about if remote learning is going to happen, um, trying to have a better understanding about what the actual teaching modality and or instruction that will happen, as you can see with the monkey on my back and some of the concerns that some of the other parents were talking about with the younger students. Um, it seems like a strong strategy is going to need to be in play aside from just um, offline and synchronicity of some kind. And I don't know what that is, but I appreciate that plans are starting to roll out. And I know this is still a work in progress, but wanted to raise the concern of having a real structure about what that modality would be so that if we have to be remote, um, there's plans for a positive learning experience in the remote um, environment. Thank you, Amanda. Next, uh, Lori McCullough. Hi again. I, I just wanted to point out that um, if there is, again, again, I want I want the school year to start fully remotely, um, and five percent infection rate. Ooh, I, I don't think that's anything to be delighted about. Um, but on top of that, I want to point out that if most kids are remote, they're still can be some kids for whom the teachers and the principals decide um, they can you, you have the option of having some special students in the classroom or in the school for for instruction it doesn't have to be absolutely everybody so there can be exceptions to that 
um, I just wanted to throw that out. Thank you, Laurie. Anthony Fiden. Hi, thanks for, uh, thanks for hosting tonight. I just wanted to, uh, to express my view that, uh, that we should reopen the schools to in-person learning as soon as possible. In my view, we've, we've gained a lot of knowledge since March and April. We really, we clearly don't know everything, but we know a lot more than we did about who's at risk, how the virus is spread and how to prevent it. And we also know a lot more about the public health risks that go, that go far beyond the virus. That's, I'm talking about the risk to our children's education, their socialization, and their emotional health. And uh, I think that's, uh, that those are serious considerations that if we, if we continue to wait for uh, some magic number in the infection rates or, or, or another figure, we're, we're just, we're, going, we're not going to open. Um, the, uh, my hope is that we use the knowledge that we've gained to, to, to proceed with the, on the premise that we will, will reopen the schools to in-person learning and that we'll, we'll make it work. And, and, and there are going to be, there are going to be uh, infections, there are going to be things that happen, there are going to be challenges, but I, I'm really hoping that we proceed on that premise that we, we can make it work and that we, that we will make it work and that we, um, that we really can't continue to give in to, um, to fears and that, that we may ultimately do more damage than we prevent. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Michelle Watowitz. Hi, thank you, Heather. And I wanna say thank you to um, all of our administration school committee members and the parents on the call. I know um, you all have been working very hard and this is not an easy decision to make. Um, as most people on the call know, I am an elementary school teacher. I also have two elementary age children. Um, I am speaking as a parent. Um, as a Hadley community member, a parent of two children at the elementary school. Um, I probably share similar sentiments as many parents do with the effect that the remote learning had on them in the spring. Um, needless to say, it was, it was challenging for my children. Um, with that said, I wanna reiterate one point that was brought up earlier on the call and to keep in mind the pediatrician's um, point of view and when considering the whole child, um, their remarks and guidelines um, are something that we have talked about as a family. And secondly, um, I would like to point out something that I haven't yet heard, and that's the point of the view of the child. Um, I know in speaking to my own children, and that's all I can say at this point, these are the only two children I've had uh, lengthy conversations with, um, we have talked about what school may look like and the changes that occur and what that even that overflow space may be because those are all questions we all have right now. They circle back every time to wanting to be in person. Um, I just want to throw that out there because I think there's real power in that. Um, Again, I'm a parent of a second grader and a fourth grader. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Meg Kane. Meg, you're muted if you're speaking. I'll... Hi. Here we go. Okay, here I am. Uh, thank you for your time and your hard work, everyone. I have a fourth and sixth grader at the elementary school and an eighth grader at Hopkins. And I want to echo sentiments we've already heard about the children going back in person. I really hope that the school committee will make their decision and everyone involved in the actual decision process based on the science that we have and the numbers that we have. I know it's not a perfect system, but you know, as things change rapidly, but I know there's a lot of pressure out there and a lot of fear and a lot of people are looking at their friends, going to hybrid models or remote learning. And I really hope we'll make our decisions based on what we know in our community. And my personal preference would be for my children to go back to school. Um, 
without the remote learning piece up front to go back to the cohort model. And that's because I feel like you all have done a very good job sussing out the information and making sure that it'll be as safe as possible. And I trust that. And my kids are like those that others have mentioned, they need to go back. And I think we don't know yet the long-term effects of children being away from their peers for this long. And I think that we're going to know that in a few years. And as a parent, I don't want my kids, and I'm sure most parents feel like this about all their kids, to be the ones, you know, that have a gap in their social emotional learning or um, these other maybe less tangible parts of their life that school benefits so much, so much more than academics. So thank you very much. Thank you, Meg. Alessandra. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody that has been working so hard to make sure that the kids go back, if the kids go back, they're gonna be safe as much as possible. Uh, I am an optimist, but I am not a reckless optimist. And uh, all things considered, to me, the, the best uh, move would be to start remote and then take it from there because we don't know what's gonna happen with all the students coming back to UMass and to the other colleges. We don't know. We do know, we do know what happened in other schools in Georgia and Israel that had low number and then they went back and then whole bro uh, hell broke loose. So that, that's something that I really would like the committee to take into consideration. And uh, I understand that kids uh, want to go back in, in part, but they, there was also to keep in, we need to keep in mind that they are going to go back to a completely different experience. And one thing is talking about going back to a different experience. And another thing is leaving that different experience, not, not being able to interact with your uh, classmates the way you wanted to. This continues, don't touch each other, stay away from another, wear your mask, it's anxiety producing. Have we considered the, this factor? Because we are going to put these children in a, in, a, in a place where anxiety is going to be very high. The teacher are going to be scared and the kids are going to be scared. So I understand that this is a heartbreakingly hard decision. I see everybody's point of view and I appreciate it because they are excellent point of view. You know, they, they, make, a, they make a lot of sense at the same time I just want to remind everybody that we can fix things, we cannot fix death. That is something that we need to keep in mind at all times. We can go back, we can reassess, we cannot resuscitate a person, a grandparent, a teacher, a friend that is gonna die because he's gonna get infected. I thank you again for your attention and for all your hard work and good luck to the school committee. Thank you, Alessandra. Mm -hmm. Paula Cristoforo. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm a community member. I'm also a teacher in the elementary school, as many people know. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, I've had um, communications with Dr. McKenzie and Principal Dowd as well. Um, I personally believe that we should be starting remotely. Um, and when I spoke with Dr. Mc, uh, when I spoke with um, both of them, one of my, I mean, I have a family member who lives as well. Um, obviously, obviously that's a personal concern, but here is the way that I'm looking at it. My family, of, of five um, has only been around approximately four or five other people since we've been in lockdown. For me, it's looking at, you know, for the children, the community, we're looking at going back to school and in our full in-person plan, we're looking at potentially hundreds of people that we're gonna eventually be exposed to right off the bat. I think it's way too many. 
Um, I do think that concerns me immensely um, for my students, for myself, um, for my family, um, to say, here, I've been around just a handful of other people, and then I'm going to go back to a, a school that is going to have a couple of hundred people. Um, with adults and children. So my, you know, my personal feeling is that I believe we should start remotely. And one point I wanted to make about the data that I was wondering about, um, knowing that we have so many children that um, are school choice. I know we said we're looking at Hampshire County data, obviously that's where we're located. But we have, we have so many families from so many other communities I'm wondering how that's going to be taken into consideration as well in terms of thinking about, you know, last year, maybe 30 or 40% of my class was from all different other communities and they weren't all in Hampshire County. Um, so I think that's another consideration to be thinking about where we have our students, we have a pretty good uh, amount of school choice students in Hadley and where those students are coming from. Um, you know, we're lucky to have every single one of them, but I think we have to look at data in other communities as well, because these children live in these communities as well. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Next, we have Francis J's iPhone is what it says. Francis J. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Araxia, uh, Frank's wife. Um, so Frank McInerney. <laughs> um, so I'm speaking as a parent and as a nurse. Uh, I work in um, I work in Bay State. I worked with uh, throughout the pandemic, and um, as a nurse, I have seen this virus, this infection, up close, and um, it is it is awful. Um, as a parent, um, I, I will be, I, I want remote learning for my child uh, for now. Um, I 100% remote learning. I will not be sending my child to school. Um, I know the school and administration is doing a wonderful job, excellent job, all their efforts. I am, I truly appreciate, I'm grateful for it. Please do not misunderstand me. I am grateful for everything you are trying to do. I know why am I undermining your efforts. I just, as a, uh, I just choose to keep my child at home, um, no matter what, because I know as much as we all try, it's still gonna, it's, it's going to affect us. It's going to affect our community. And if you've been following the recent events at Bay State, I just please understand where I'm coming from. Um, I understand the, some parents' concerns about the long-term effects of not going to school, the not socializing, the, the um, not great academic experience. I understand that, but I also want to, everyone to understand, Yes, we don't know the long-term, we do know the long-term effects of what may do not being in school, not socializing. Um, trust me, I, in my lifetime, in my home country, I have gone through a couple of disasters. I have lost large months of school in my lifetime. It's gonna be okay. What we don't know is the long-term effects of this virus. What, what my, well, my husband's and our, our worst nightmare is not just that our child may get the virus, but also when that child infects someone that may have a poor outcome and not even a poor outcome, go end up in a hospital or anything. How do we support that child? How do we help them? How are we gonna deal with that when a number of kids come home and affect their uh, parents, grandparents, siblings, or anybody else. That's, let's think about those long-term effects, how we are going to support our kids. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. I, I am not concerned about her, honestly, her academic performance. I am, I just want her to be safe. I want everyone to be safe and academically we'll catch up, we'll get there. This is a temporary 
disaster and we are going to get through it. And at this time, let's make sure we are doing everything we can to keep our children, our community safe. It's just, it's still there. Just because the numbers are down doesn't mean it's not as bad as it was back in March. And trust me, this is an awful virus. I've seen it and I know it. Please do not take it lightly because our community hasn't been affected as badly as some of the other communities across the world and um, even in, in America. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, Cassie Stewart is next. Hi, how's it going? You get a two for one today. I'm Greg Stewart, Cassie. Uh, I just want to lobby on behalf of technology and training as well. So there are some simple things you can do that just concern physics, lighting, acoustics, microphone placement, things that will improve remote learning. And that's important for the instructors and teachers as much as it is important for the students who are on the far end of that learning and participating remotely. Um, in my opinion, my child flourishes during remote learning. He chugs through his work. We have to slow him down so that he goes at the pace that he's instructed to go. We work on robotics. We play with CNC machines and 3D printers. We're blessed in that respect at our home that we can provide that type of learning environment and stimulus for him between uh, Cassie and I. I know that's not the case everywhere, but in my opinion, making more room for the students who need that in-person experience, not as much the students who might like that for the, for the uh, interpersonal interaction would be the best course of action. So the children with IEPs, with independent educational programs, if we can prioritize providing them with the best in-person experience, it will reduce exposure and the number of people who are going to be at risk. And it will um, be the best benefit, I think, for the students at Hadley Elementary School. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Michael Quash. Hi, so firstly, thank you to the administration and the school committee for um, putting this on. Um, I'm Bobby Clash. I'm going to be a senior at Hopkins Academy this year. And I think from the student perspective right now, I'm in favor or I'm at least wanting to go back to school. But then I think about things where <clears throat> there are people coming to school in the morning and they park their cars and then they're mingling together without masks or they're leaving the school. And then there's mixing of students without masks or space or protection. And that kind of bothers me. And I don't think that if there's going to be an unsafe opportunity for things to happen at school that I don't want to go back to that. And I think that if we can ensure that protections are being provided at all times, then it could work. But if those opportunities exist, then I think I would be more in favor of remote learning. And then just from a student perspective, and I know I've talked with a few other people, but the remote experience in the spring was a little rough just because it was thrown together very quickly because we obviously were launched into this very quickly and it was kind of tough with one or two hours of work per week. And I think that this fall, if we're able to do it where the remote experience is similar to that in the classroom is where it's structured. It's kind of like the schedule that was put out, the cohort schedule where there's class blocks at certain times and then students can have a kind of personalized experience with the teacher where they're being taught directly that I think I would be in favor of doing that remotely in order to keep everyone safe and to provide the best educational experience for everyone. And I know that myself and probably other students included would be happy to help the teachers if necessary to set any of that up. But I think if we can't have complete safety at the school, that would be in favor of more structured re remote setup. Hi, this is uh, Bobby's dad, Michael, also. And I'm looking at this also like a parent. Um, I want to thank the, the school committee and Annie and the principals. Like your work on this has been exemplary. And in my line of work, I, I'm in contact with probably 30 school districts around the country. And when I talk to the people in the different districts, some of them are open, some of them are opening in August. Um, I have yet to get a phone call of somebody telling me that it's working and that they feel safe and it's all successful. I had friends in Avon, Indiana, who opened this past week. They already have teachers and students at the school who have, have diagnosed positive. Um, and we have the luxury of time. We're not opening for another month, so we do have the ability to look at the numbers, make a very 
you know, educated um, uh, plan for what we're doing. And we do have the, the benefit of having a state that gives us guidelines. I have friends who teach in Texas, the TEA is doing nothing for them. I have a friend who works in the Vandergrift school system in Leander ISD. Their plan was to tell the teachers to go home and make your garage into an apartment or get a trailer and go home and make a living will. That was the best they could give their teachers. So I'm more interested in the safety of the teachers, the staff and the students. To me, that comes first. And when I start to hear school districts that have positive experiences and learn how to make this work, I know with all the work in the world, nobody has a crystal ball, but I would feel better when there's success in some of these school districts to, to learn from. Thank you. Thank you very much. Full disclosure, that was my husband, Michael Klesch, and my son, Bobby Klesch, just so folks know, speaking as a parent and as a student at Hopkins Academy. All right, we also have uh, Linda Lobel, parent of Ethan Lobel, hand raised. Last thing, this will be 30 seconds. I agree with Michael. I've been watching the MTA stuff on the TV, and I think the vast majority, 80% plus of teachers in the state are against opening the schools. And I feel like we should respect the teachers and make the decision that's right for everybody. And I, I, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Linda. All right, I'm gonna give folks um, another 10 seconds here. Oh, we've got another hand raised. And just so folks know, there, um, this is the last hand I see raised. If you would like to contribute to public comment, uh, please raise your digital hand. Felicia Seymour. Hello, everybody. I want to give the perspective of a parent of a preschooler who was supposed to start at the beginning of April. Um, we had almost every evaluation done for my son, who's also got special needs. Um, he has autism and he's hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion is I will not be sending him if we open back up in person, even though he does thrive with having um, being in person and needing that social interaction. I will not be sending him because within, you know, within our household, there's three of us, but he's got grandparents that, you know, one has MS and the other one's older and they can get sick really easily. Why would I risk my son's health, our little family's health, and then like a little bit of extended family that we have just to send him to school? Um, and my other concern is, especially with the kids that have special needs like hearing loss or anything like that, that need to have the peer interaction, but not every kid and not every a teacher and adult can wear like a clear mask um, for kids that need the extra lip reading or um, especially my son who was just told by his psych the, uh, psycho uh, psychologist that he needs one-on-one -on -one teaching. How are we supposed to feel okay with anybody being close to, especially to a child that can't wear a mask or that can, uh, won't wear one, like my son, especially he's three, how are you going to explain to a three-year-old and other three-year-olds, you guys can't co near each other, what would be the point of sending him for, you know, that social and peer interaction um, when I rather just do it over Zoom, which is half as easy for him to meet with other kids and talk to other kids if he doesn't pay attention that's whatever but you know you can try we are very lucky with what we have is be able to work with aba at home through the fall so we you know not every parent is lucky but my opinion if it was remotely i would probably send him thank you guys for everything you guys are doing thank you felicia appreciate it next we have rebecca de bartolomeo Good evening, everyone. This is actually Matt DeBartolomeo speaking. Uh, Dr. Klesch, members of the uh, school committee, thank you for your time and effort on this. Uh, administrators of the two schools, very much appreciated your time. Um, wanted to offer an additional perspective. Um, I really appreciate the feedback provided by everyone this evening. It's very helpful to hear parents, grandparents, family and friends speak on behalf of, of their particular beliefs associated with you know, how they feel uh, schools should start up again in the fall. Um, as an individual with um, uh, two, in, two students in the high school uh, this coming fall and uh, my, my wife is a teacher at the elementary school, um, but there's been a lot of discussion in, in my home about what the fall should look like and what we believe will be best for uh, our children. At this point, you know, listening to the perspectives of this group as well as the conversations we've had in our home, 
we would like to urge the school committee to consider the remote option for starters uh, with an opportunity to reevaluate after the school year starts to determine the best method for returning to school, particularly as we watch um, what's happening uh, both in the school, uh, in the county, and then also across the nation, you know, hearing other feedback from individuals such as Mr. Klesh talk about what's happening in other districts that he's interacted with was certainly helpful to hear. And I think it's just reinforced our opinion that uh, a remote learning option to start would be uh, best for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next, we have Lauren Cro Croach, Croce. I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Lauren? Yes, it's Lauren Croce. And I just wanted to very simply say as well, thank you to everybody. It has been an incredible amount of work done here. I just want to go with the idea that we should lean towards what's known. And what's known is the least risk is the best risk. <laughs> and um, I think we also know that kids uh, do best with consistency. And if for, any, for whatever reason we would have put a situation out that had to be changed um, to go back to what has not been normal, which is being home, would be more risky than starting out saying it's still not safe. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, next, we have Lisa Giddens. Ditto, everyone, on the thank you. <laughs> I know it's a hard, hard challenge. There's two teachers who I greatly respect who are on different sides of this that have already talked today. And I think that that represents how difficult this decision is for each of us in our own individual circumstances. So thank you. Um, today, I would, in fact, I'm sitting in my office. I'm, I'm at the UMass uh, uh, campus and I'm looking out because I work with the residence halls and we have some students that are supposed to return on Monday. And I can tell you objectively observing that there are students that walk freely in large groups unmasked. And I, I really am fearful about what the implications are for our students and being able to set them up for safety. So I'm thinking about it greatly at the collegiate level, but I'm also worried about how we will do that effectively in the school, specifically the elementary school. I had signed my child up for basketball camp, um, outdoor basketball camp, bring your own ball, only skills and drills. And she's not there today because yesterday when she went, you know, um, half the people weren't wearing their masks, yet they were running around and they're passing their basketballs back and forth and that type of thing. So I think part of, um, part of what I would love to believe in is kind of the, yes, we can do this, we can rise as a society. And I think the other part that I'm actually really holding as I observe outside and I think about my own child today is the reality of being able to do this for kids. It's really hard. It's hard for college kids. It's even harder for elementary and high school kids. So I just, I would like us to really think around how do we set people up for success? The numbers are continuing to raise. Um, one of my colleagues, sisters, in, 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 how are you say it, intubated seven people yesterday. You know, like the numbers continue. And that's not, I don't want to operate out of fear, but I think it's a reality that we really have to manage. So if we are going to end up remote anyway, let's start there. Let's really enhance our faculty and our pedagogy and all of the pieces that we need to have to have that go effectively and then slowly bring people back in so it is safe. So it's safe for some of these folks that are sitting here around the table to be with their families. So I see that there's more people coming. So sorry for all the time I'm taking, but I do want us to really think about setting our students up and our families and our community for success. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. It's appreciated. Maureen Tumenas. Hi, I'm the tech integration specialist at Hadley Elementary, mostly. I do a little bit at Hawkins. And I would like to echo a request to please open remotely. We can't do, have a do-over. We will have people who get infected and we can't fix that once it happens. We, we would have to turn on a dime, close things back down and then reopen again once it's safer. I also would like to echo Nancy's original comments about not knowing what the student impact will be when the college kids come back to the Valley. I know it's a month away, but I would like everyone to feel the safety of opening up remotely. And that's all. Thank you, Maureen. And Maureen, you were the last uh, person to have your hand raised. Um, so with that, I believe we are going to uh, close public comment. I thank everyone for sharing um, your personal stories, your personal insights, um, your feelings, 
and um, the facts, and it's appreciated. I know I speak on behalf of all of the school committee members that it's very much appreciated to hear from you, so thank you. Uh, with that, I think we're going to move now into our action item. Is that correct, Annie? It's pulling up the agenda. Yes, sorry, I was muted. Yes. Uh, okay, so our action item um, for tonight, we need to deliberate um, what we've heard, uh, approval, um, and take a vote of what our, uh, as of now, district reopening plan recommendation would be. So Paul, Humera, Ethan, Tara, you've, you've heard a lot about this. You, I know we all have our perspectives on this. I think this is a great opportunity for us to um, you know, deliberate this publicly and talk about where we are in terms of the feedback we've received and the plans that we're at. Um, would anybody like to begin? So just to clarify, this is Paul Heather. So the first question is whether we support the plan overall, because that's, we have to provide that to Desi, or are we choosing an individual option under the plan? Um, what we need to do, I believe tonight is twofold, supporting the three plans that were put forward to that are put forward to Desi in terms of in-person plan, um, hybrid plan, and remote plan, and then we do need to vote on our initial recommendation um, as of tonight. I'm happy to begin um, with um, my comments on this, um, Heather. If you so wish me to begin. Yes, please. Go ahead, Humera. Okay, great. Um, I have a number of post-it notes um, written out here. So if you see me looking at my table, it's because there's a lot of post-it notes here. <laughs> uh, so bear with me, uh, friends, on this call, um, all 112 of you. Um, this is, I think this is a record. Um, in the days leading up to this decision, I was in favor of choice of people being able to send uh, their kids to an in-person option if they desired and, uh, and to take that risk if they were so inclined uh, and to, for others to keep their kids remote uh, if, if they were not willing to take that risk and if they were in um, admittedly a privileged position to make that call. Uh, I personally am in that privileged position. I am able to keep my kids home and no matter what would be exercising the remote option because I do not feel the risk is worth, um, worth it for my family. But, and we were given this unprecedented task right, to like get up to speed on 100 documents and imagine these scenarios and figure this out for a community and without the skills or training necessarily to do this, but we were up for that task. And for about two weeks, we were looking at these documents, reviewing in-person hybrid and remote documents, and came up with a pretty amazing plan, a pretty solid plan. I have to commend Annie, the principals, the whole team with coming up with a data-driven plan. Um, you know, if, if the numbers exceeded a certain amount, then we would do this. And if they were, were maintained at this level, then we could move on to the next stage. It shows that we were managing the situation. And we all came marching to this date, August 6th, to vote on the overall three plans. And then this past Tuesday, August 4th, our state politicians changed their mind. The commissioner and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education changed their mind and said, no, you cannot approve all three of those plans and make a decision based on data. You have to decide now what happens on September 14th. And, you know, forget the data. Now, I'm not saying that we would do that or that we would find that acceptable for our community. But to even think that that was okay and then what's more, they employed a strong arm technique and said, if your students are remote, whatever students, whatever parents opt for their kids to be remote, they may not 
necessarily be able to access sports. So now I do feel like they don't really have our best interests at heart. I really feel as though we are on our own when making this decision. And I no longer trust that the legal right that they gave us, this one-time right to review these plans and decide what's possible, I no, I no longer trust that that will maintain, that, be, that that right will be maintained. And that if we were to say, let's go open, that that could again be a bait and switch. And that we may not have the ability after, that, after making that decision to change plans or adjust based on data. And, and given this bait and switch, this violation of trust, I don't believe that we're compelled to rush it. I don't believe we're compelled to make a decision by the date they have given us. And I have researched and found that in the last 20 years of making decisions here at Hadley, some decisions that comply with the requested advice and the guidelines and others that do not, that there have been consequences that have hurt our uh, financial future or anything else. And for that reason, I don't think we should do anything unless we are 100% certain that it's the right decision for our community. And while I believed in choice and like, you know, whatever, if you feel like you wanna take that risk, you should go for it. I actually really care about your family. I actually really care about your kids. I care about their grandchildren. I care about the fact that 80% of Hadley's residents do not have kids in the school system. And our students and parents will be walking around town, holding railings, going to grocery stores. And that 80%, most of whom I believe, a, a vast population of whom are elderly, would be at risk. And so while I could stay cloistered up in my home, I don't think it's right that we put everyone else at risk. And I'm not really satisfied with the current plan, although we've put enormous amounts of information, like unbelievable thinking into this plan, that we are as safe as we can, as we can be. I, I'm not convinced that we've been as creative as we can be. I know that we could be smarter and better and more creative at how we look at these plans. And so I'm not in any rush to improve, uh, to, to approve this plan. I think that opening is a risk. I think that that risk is death. I do. I mean, I, I don't wanna get to a position where I'm like, I know that person, I knew that person and they're no longer dead. So how do we minimize that risk? How do we reduce the number of students in the classroom and I know these remote plans are coming in hot, right? We've been having conversation with our educators over the last week and they've been responding based on what they heard last Thursday. And we said that remote cannot be an afterthought, that it isn't about technology, but it is about pedagogy. It is about the way in which we teach. It's not about the tools that we use. I don't think the answer is sitting in a seat all day long, like a schedule, like you would have in person. That's not online education. That's not great online education. And so I really don't know that we know what we're doing when it comes to remote plans. And I'm not crazy about the current remote plans. I know they're incomplete. I know we have a lot more work to do. And I think that if we delay the decision that parents can make an informed choice about the remote option. I know there are parents who could keep their child at home, who might find remote to be more manageable, who could potentially come to terms with the fact that kids are resilient. They will be okay. They will be okay. They will be okay in life. I also know that 
for 350 years that we've been teaching in Hadley, PD has been focused on in-person education. Never has it been focused on online education. I think we could take the next several weeks, the next month, to do that really well. And not just like homegrown. I mean like, you know, spend the money if we have to, to get the best. I volunteer to help. I've been teaching online for eight years. I work for Stanford. I have weeks off in August. I'd be happy to help. I think we should review, take those weeks to negotiate a union plan because I think educators could get behind this. I think we should review and focus on online plans that principals approve of and that educators and their peers approve of. And I think we need to get clear and up to speed on amazing remote education. Also, I don't think we can have a one size fits all because there are equity issues at play here. There are IEPs, there are kids with SPED needs, special education needs, there are kids at risk, there are kids who are poor, there are parents who's, who are on the front lines who need their kids in school. And there are some kids that are just not going to cut it with remote education. Okay, well, what if we got clear about that population? Not who intends to send their kids to in-person education, but rather, do you fit into any of those categories that, we, that I just said? Imagine if teachers could go back into their classrooms and those classrooms became design studios for online education. And the students that were in that space were just the five or 10 that fit into that category. And they were the first learners of the online techniques that the educators were trying out. Yes, they're in person, but they didn't have any unique advantage for being in person. Students were equal across the board, in person and online. Imagine how much greater bandwidth educators would have in creating those amazing online experiences and how much safer they'd be by having smaller populations of students in that class. So I'm in favor of getting clear on this plan. I'm in favor of putting as much effort into that remote option, which it's very likely we may all be in that boat when we reopen. But if we're gonna stay open at all for anyone, we have to get really clear on what that looks like. This is our opportunity. This is our chance to do it right. And I believe we should hold on voting until August 31st, until after we get solid on what remote looks like, and we have a signed union MOU in hand. Thanks. Thanks, Humara. I'm happy to go next, unless um, some Paul or Tara or Ethan would like to. You can go. Go ahead, and there, yeah. Okay. Um, I also have notes, so forgive me if I look like I'm reading a document over here. So if you had asked me two weeks ago, um, I was also in favor of an in-person return with that phased in cohort model. Um, my basis for this was to get back to teachers seeing kids, the economic impacts that, and um, favorable economic impact that would have to families and to the town, um, and to give families the choice of sending their child back to school or to choose to have them attend remotely. Um, in retrospect, I thought about it a lot more. I read through all of the plans in great detail. Um, I started to worry that by going down this road, we were essentially passing the buck, honestly. I felt like we were saying, yeah, we're going to do this, but now it's up to you whether you want to take that risk or not. Um, Humera, you said that. And that's exactly what I started feeling, like um, we've made this vote but we're still um, leaving it in the family's hands to rack their brains over what decision to make here. Um, I want face-to-face -face instruction, I really do. But from the schools that we've seen nationally uh, going back so far, we're not seeing success stories. I'm not gonna personalize this and it's not about me or my family. 
Um, but I agree that while face-to-face -face instruction is extremely important, I don't feel it's prudent to begin with this method. Um, this is not in any way a comment on the efforts that have been undertaken by the administration and by everyone involved in the planning. There's been so much effort going, gone into all of these plans. Um, but hearing from Hadley's teachers directly and hearing from the HEA, the survey results, uh, I've shifted my thinking. And a comment that really resonated with me that was said to me was, it feels to me like we're being asked to report to work for a job which has not yet been determined. It's hard for folks to get behind something when you know they don't know what direction we're headed in. So I do think we should vote tonight. I think we should vote on where we are as of now to give some clarity as to what the future of our thinking is, where we can really put our efforts into uh, for the next month. We have basically five weeks. Um, to, so as of now, I'd like for us to think about um, what we support with the data as of today. Uh, but to decide on an in-person plan Plan now and to possibly have that change three weeks from now based on negative trends in health data, based on a return of college students to the area, which many speakers brought up, and that is a valid concern, um, that would be the most disruptive to all. And I'm in favor of the least disruptive model right now. I don't want to disrupt families, educators, administrators, or students that we're expecting to go back. Um, so at this point in time, my main concerns are around giving families clarity on a move forward plan that is educationally sound and that minimizes the risk with the least amount of family disruption. Um, I'm in favor of an all remote plan to start with a phase in to face to face instruction. Uh, I do not think that remote instruction from the spring is an assumed, you know, we shouldn't assume that that's what we're going to see this fall. And I see that I see that reflected in the plans, the improvements that um, are intended there and the, the structure that is being put around that remote instruction. I do think the remote model would emphasize the need to deliver online instruction from day one to all. That seems to me the most equitable plan. And then uh, there may be a shift to the hybrid model. My concern with be, being hybrid from day one, which is essentially what we would be if we went back to face to face and had the options for families to have their child attend remotely, we're gonna be hybrid, right? So to me, that seems the most difficult approach and mastering a truly educationally engaging remote plan seems a prudent way to move forward and to provide clarity to families now about where we intend to start in September. Obviously, this would be contingent upon an agreement with the um, Hadley Educators, Educators Association with the union. Um, the investment and efforts that have been made on, on a return to in-person instruction, the tents, the ventilation, none of these are a wasted effort. All of these prepare us for a time when we can shift to that phased in instruction approach. Um, so I'm in favor of beginning the school year with an all remote plan with a future phase in face-to-face -face instruction and to invest continued efforts in the remote plan development um, now and to make it as robust and educationally sound as possible. So go, go ahead. Okay. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, so um, I'm the same as Heather and Humera in that I have notes everywhere um, and I probably won't speak quite as eloquently because I've just got so many thoughts going through my head um, the past few weeks, the entire summer, um, basically when school stopped, what is this going to look like as things keep evolving, as weeks and months keep going on? Um, and then as we get um, continuous feedback and input, and you know, I, I so very much appreciate all the work that the reopening committee has put in just, just alone in the past week with all of the feedback they were given from the last meeting. Um, they have put so much time and effort um, in listening to um, concerns of the community and of school committee and um, teachers and parents. And I appreciate all that. And I really appreciate um, the parents as well and the community as well, because um, both in the meeting tonight and in the meeting we had last week and in the numerous, numerous emails that have gone to the administration that then again get forwarded to the school committee, um, I appreciate the opinions, the inputs, the thoughts, because it's so hard to think about an all-encompassing plan with just a few people, no matter how hard you try. And there are things you just don't think about. So it really takes a whole community to really help um, 
come up with a really thorough um, plan, but also how respectful everyone has been. Um, there are really emotional um, thoughts behind people's opinions as to why they would pick in person versus remote and no one way is right or wrong and there is no ideal here but the one thing I'm so appreciative of is that everyone has been so very respectful and that's just not the case everywhere you, you hear a lot of um, contention and it's it's just so refreshing to know that even with a differing of opinions we're all able to still talk about those opinions in a very respectful manner um, and so myself, um, I have gone back and forth over the past few weeks to the past month, um, both as a school committee member and as a parent. Um, I, I see the surveys and I see the struggles that parents are having um, in regards to in-person. I get it. It is very hard to be a working parent um, and try to take care of a kid when you um, have them home. I know the spring was really challenging. Um, and I, I get that. Um, and then I look at it from my own perspective going, gosh, I, I want to send my child back to school because I don't want him to miss out on those interactions. I don't want him to miss out on having a face to face with his teacher and being with his friend. But at the same time, I'm so hesitant to send him back. Um, and I lean towards remote and then I, I worry about what that would do to him um, on a social emotional level. I, I, I go back and forth wholeheartedly just on an hourly basis thinking about it. It's always been in the back of my mind, um, especially since we started the conversation last week and reviewing these plans. It's so hard to know what's right, not only for yourself as a parent and your child and your family, but then to have to come together and look at the school as a whole. Um, it's a really difficult decision to make. And what I do know is that I wouldn't want us as a school, as a district, as a town, um, to make a decision that could potentially negatively impact our students and our community long term. Um, I work in a hospital and I work with patients. I have direct patient care um, and I'm within feet, way less than three feet of patients um, all day long. Um, and what I will tell you is that adults alone have a really hard time wearing masks all day long. They do. It's, it's just challenging. Patients come in and they're there for a 20 minute appointment um, and they're complaining about wearing the mask. Adults are constantly touching their masks, readjusting things. They have a hard time. Um, they'll often say, I don't know how you can wear this mask all day. And what I will tell you is that it is hard to wear a mask all day. Um, my lunch break, I get to go outside and I get to take my mask off. And that is one of the highlights of the day. So physically, children can wear masks all day. People can wear masks all day and they will be just fine. And I understand there are certain populations of people that would, that would struggle and that we need to consider. But overall, people can wear masks all day and, and physically will be just fine. Um, for our children, I. I get it that a lot of parents think that their children are acclimated to masks. Um, my son's been going into summer school and he only has his mask on for 45 minutes. And by the end of that 45 minutes, he walks out of the school building and the first thing he does is rip off his mask. And that's 45 minutes. I think it's a really high expectation, especially for the little ones to have to wear that all day and for the teachers to have to um, mitigate their from touching and keeping the distance and whatnot. It's just asking a lot on our staff to try to teach in a new method that they're not used to and may not be comfortable with, and then having our students in there as well. Um, I think that inevitably, if we were to start out in in-person, that we would go through all three different phases of these plans. I think that at some point we're gonna be fully remote. And I am more concerned about the back and forth that students would have. Um, shifting once cases hit. Um, I understand we're a small community and there's probably not going to be as great of spread in our community, but I still wouldn't want to take that risk. I wouldn't want to be one of the only districts in the state that has everybody back in the school um, and be um, in person and have something go terribly wrong and have us be an example of what could be. Um, that scares me too a little bit, thinking about um, you know, the risk of going back when 
the majority of our state, even if we're not making a decision for a state, and we can't because I understand we're a small district, we have small classroom sizes, but I would still hate to be um, an example of what could have went wrong when we have the opportunity um, to start out remote and figure this out. I agree with Humera and Heather, and we need to dedicate um, as much time and resources and brain power as we can to um, to um, strengthen our remote learning, to provide teachers with adequate access and make sure they're comfortable with remote learning. And I think that um, starting out the year remote will also um, help kids understand what it's gonna look like should we go back into school and then have to go remote again. Then we're gonna be prepared. So if we start out the year real strong with remote, and then it turns out we're able to phase back in and then something happens we can go back remote we've already got a really strong foundation but it's not going to be so traumatic and um stressful and anxiety driven for kids to have to go back remote because they've they started out that year with a really strong remote program um i know i'm all over the place um i agree with monitoring data um, but right now i just think it's too hard um, making a decision right now for what's going to happen on September 14th. I'm concerned that if we made a decision to say, well, we're going to start with doing the phased in in person model. Um, and then five weeks from now, we have an upward tick and the trends are no longer favorable. What detriment that will cause to families um, when they've been planning this whole time. Well, we're going to be in person. They've planned their whole next five weeks around that. And then it's shifted. I feel like um, we should provide families with 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 a stable even if it's not desirable to everybody um with a stable plan right now and then slowly incorporate just as humara and heather said um in-person learning as far as the phased beginnings um i do I'm, I'm very happy to see that we have the phased beginning with remote learning as, in general i'm happy to see the six weeks um attending remotely um, I'm still a little uncomfortable thinking about phase two in that plan going to a five day a week, even if it's only a half day and there's early dismissal. Um, it's, it, it's a lot of students all back at once still, even if we wait. I mean, six weeks is just, again, delaying it. We're going to have more information then um, about trends, um, but it's still bringing all the students back really quickly. And I would like us to consider um, as we continue moving forward. Um, with a more hybrid model going in, even if it's something where we, we have the ability to keep students six feet apart um, when they go back in person, not having them back every single day and having a slower transition back into school, um, rather than just having the five days a week, if we bring them back two or three days, um, that allows us to still have um, less exposure time on a weekly basis for students. Um, gather more data. And it also eases our students in to having to adjust to this, um, I hate saying the term new normal, but our new normal, because no matter when we get back to a full five days, the masks aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, even post vaccine, we, we're still going to have to remain with a lot of safety precautions in place. And I do worry about that full five days. Um, so I'd like to see us start with remote learning. Um, and then again, not only perfect remote learning, but maybe really look at our phase reopening and figure out a way to um, improve that just a little bit more. And I heard people talk about, well, allowing, uh, or in Humera just did, allowing students in that have special needs or um, homelessness or any other factors that might be able to come into play to start them out first and phase it in. I don't know exactly what I think it should look like, but I just think we could do more phasing and be a little bit more cautious. And I know that that's not a popular opinion with everybody, but I think that the school committee and the district is tasked with keeping the community as safe as possible while providing as um, robust a learning plan as they can. And that's just, it's a really, really challenging task to do. Um, and I don't envy our administration right now um, because it's, it's a lot of work to try to put into place. And I don't envy them, but I very so much appreciate them um, and their hard work that they've put in um, and their willingness to be flexible and bend and adjust and take these comments and make things better. And their, con their brains are constantly working too. And you can see it. Um, they're constantly trying to find ways to improve it. So 
I, I think that to start remote would be best. And then we come back to the table the end of August, wherever it may be, the 24th, 31st, and see what we can do to make it an even safer approach with um, the best learning we can provide. Thanks, Tara. So I, I can go, this is Paul. Um, there's a lot that's been said that I, I agree with and I think the presenters from the public were, were very uh, heartfelt and compelling in, in lots of different ways. Um, and I wish I'd, I wish I had an answer. Um, I guess, you know, I agree that we need to spend time working on the remote learning. Uh, we've got a good start, but it needs to be, I think as some had said, it's, it's not homeschooling. It should be, um, as good as it can be, I don't think it's gonna replace, I don't have your experience, Humera, that, or maybe your optimism that it's gonna be as good as face-to-face. -face. Um, I just, maybe I'm old school that way. Um, and we're not gonna achieve zero risk. And I do imagine if we were to go back, there's some risk associated. And there's, it's not a zero risk, right? There, and there's some consequences to that risk as some of the speakers mentioned, it's some potentially serious consequences. Um, we can't determine and quantify how that is. Uh, also, as we know, we can't avoid risk in life. It's a matter of how do we live with risk and manage risk. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with what the teachers said, that 63% want to go remote. That's very compelling to me. Um, that's meaningful for me. I understand the difficulties even with this best laid plan that implementation is going to be problematic and faulty. We're not gonna do exactly as the plan said, we're gonna to have to learn and adapt and there's gonna be mistakes and there might be consequences with those mistakes. Um, I keep coming back though to the fact that nearly 80% of the, the people that responded said that, or the kids that are slated to go back with the responders wanna go back in person, but they want, uh, they're leaning towards going back in person. And so in that regards, I feel it's like our obligation. And I don't always think that leaders just need to do what their constituents say. But I think in this regard, I feel like a delegate. Like I want to try to give the public what it's asking for. And the majority of the responders have asked for a certain thing. And I think we need to do our best to provide that thing. I worry that, and I know there's a full risk as others have said, I think it's very true that what, whatever de decision we make tonight, we might decide. And again, I, we're gonna revisit this decision in the August 24th meeting. We'll revisit it in the August 31st meeting, which you could have another meeting prior to uh, September 14th. So we will we'll have three times to revisit this. And I know that's very confusing to people who need to plan. Uh, if you read the comments in some of those surveys, they're very compelling as well, both in both ways. There are some very, uh, people very, very concerned that if school's not in session, they don't know how they keep their job. That's a real consequence to a lot of our families as well. And I just feel in this regard, I, I can't, um, because it's not clear one way or the other, I don't feel like I have a compelling reason to disregard what the majority of parents are asking for. I think we need to work hard to provide them a, as reasonable an option as we can, knowing it's gonna be faulty, knowing there's risk. I have to trust in the, those parents that they're doing their due diligence to understand the risk for their child. And I believe that's true. Most of them read the plan, almost all of them read the plan. We're paying attention to the news. We all care about our children. It would not send them into undue harm and undue risk. I never think anybody would want to do this from our community, right? And so they have assessed the risk and the majority have said they want an option to provide their uh, child to have in-school uh, learning. And so I think we have to respect that and do our hardest. And I understand that potentially comes at a cost at the, as the room, to the remote learners because we can't do everything. That's unfair to ask of the administration of the, of the teachers. Um, but I guess I would vote that we, I do think we need to uh, augment the remote learning and Humera, you, I'd love to take you up on your expertise on this. I certainly don't have the expertise. Uh, let's beef that up and, and I would vote tonight to, to support that face in approach uh, and start with in-person learning with all the protocols that we have and knowing and telling folks today that that might change prior to September 14th. And, and as people mentioned, we are going to see the students come back August 24th. They've already started to come back and they're already starting to be 20 year olds, right? And we know how that is. And so there could be consequences that we all feel about that. The Hadley bubble might be affected. And if that's the case, we might have to adjust prior to school starting. And that's going to be difficult for families. I understand that. 
But right now, if the, the question, as I understand it's posed to me, is twofold. Do I support this uh, three option plan as written? Yeah, I think it, there's always work to be done. I think it's something I would support. Do I, which option do I support right now, knowing what I know today, knowing the transmission rates today? Not six weeks from now, today, I would vote to have it in person based on what I'm hearing from the families. I think that's difficult for the staff and I, I, I think we need to work hard to understand how we might be able to address some of their concerns to really unpack that survey more. And what is it we can do? And again, I think we know I need to augment remote learning such that those families, that 25% or so of families that are leaning towards or saying they're gonna do remote, that they don't have a, they have as good of a learning experience as we can provide them. Um, I will say if we go all remote, I'm not quite clear when we would shift from the all remote. At what point do we say, if we're below 5%, and I know 5% is frankly somewhat of an arbitrary standard, we're below that 5% positivity rate, uh, now when we go all remote, at what point do we say we're switching from all remote to in-person in that first phase? Or, you know, let's, let's set another standard. Is We're at 1.5%. Do we need to go below 1%? Do we need to go low, below 0.5%? Do we need to wait to a vaccine? We're going to wait. We're going to commit to do this to 2021 uh, or the entire school year. Those are the kinds of questions to be. You know, I don't. Let's let's know that each phase is going to have a choice and a consequence. So right now, I would vote for the in-person option, and with a, a reminder to the families that that could change in the next six weeks, uh, and that we'll be as transparent as we can be, and to say we should have increased effort, not just on the facilities and the uh, in-person pedagogy, but the remote learning as well. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. Wow, this is this is pretty incredible. I do want to echo Paul's comment about um, if we do start remote, what is the the threshold for us returning? I think that's the thing that continues to stick in my mind as 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 I listen to uh, parents, educators, administrators talk tonight. Is at what point do we say? The, the, the contact rate or transmission rate or the positive case rate is low enough uh, that we can return. Um, again, Hadley's in a great place right now, but I do understand that we have students coming from other districts, other counties, and, and that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, I do also want to mention, and I apologize if I go all over the place, um, I do have a lot of thoughts. Um, there, there's a lot of talk about what remote learning is going to look like. Um, and how teachers are going to teach in this remote world. Uh, I look at the fact that 63% of the teachers want to start remote as an indication that they're already planning on teaching remote if possible. And so for me, I'm less worried about how they're going to, to educate our students. Um, you know, though I, you know, as, as a parent of two youngsters, I know it's going to be kind of uh, difficult and unique, but I, I just want to kind of maybe give a shout out to the teachers and, and, understanding that what they're going through right now is incredibly difficult but i do think that they're being conscious of the fact that if if they need to go remote they're already making those plans and that i think they're going to do a good job though i think there's always room for improvement obviously this spring was kind of uh, off the cuff but this fall should be much improved if we go in if we go in that direction um like you guys have all said tonight two weeks ago i probably felt a lot more comfortable going in person. And I think honestly, um, to get right to it, I, I still feel comfortable with students returning in person, though I know, I know not every family is going to choose to do that. Uh, I think the fact that we are giving families the choice to do that uh, is, is very important. I think there are going to be quite a few parents who keep their, uh, their, their students home. I'm still kind of wrestling with that decision myself. Um, but when we look at the data uh, as it stands right now and not assuming anything, because again, if we're going to assume that the, the cases are going to increase over the next month, which uh, frankly, I do believe will happen, um, then we can revisit this decision at a later time, which is what we are planning to do, what we will do and what we will continue to do. Um, but looking at the data as it stands right now, um, we are still in a really good place. Hadley's in a very good place. We've done a lot of really good work. And I just keep thinking about this idea of if it's not good enough now, when will it be good enough? Um, and maybe that does mean remote for the entire school year. Maybe that does mean until we have a vaccine. And I know we're gonna continue to have that conversation. Um, and I'm trying to wear my school committee hat as much as possible, not my parent hat and not my educator hat. Um, and, and 
we talked about focusing on the science and focusing on the data. And every time I look at that, yes, cases are increasing, but yet we're not at a place where uh, the positivity rates are overwhelming in our county or in our town or in some of the surrounding towns to the point where I think that we need to go completely remote, though I do understand the reasons why people want to go completely remote. Um, I do uh, think we need to be aware of those uh, special populations, those students that need access to the school, whether it's for IEPs or for the other reasons that have been mentioned tonight. I think that's a bigger conversation that needs to happen. I think we do need to talk about kids that need to be in person or, or we should prioritize in person if we do go fully remote. Because uh, the reality is uh, their situations are, are so unique, um, but also that education is so vital to them. Um, and the other thing is that this decision will affect everyone differently. I don't think that we're going to make a decision that everyone approves of. I don't think we're going to make a decision that suits everybody perfectly. Um, I am in a, in a position where if I needed to keep my kids home, I could do it. I have family support, I have those things, but I know that's not the case for every family out there. And I wanna be conscious of that because we are a community and we need to be kind of united in this idea of how we're going to educate our kids moving forward, understanding that not everybody's going to be happy with the decisions that are going to be made. Um, and I guess finally, and I'll try to wrap it up, I, I think the reality is, you know, we're six weeks out from the start of school, approximately. Um, every phase is going to be six weeks. Um, so we are making a decision now, but it also sounds like we have the ability to continue to make these decisions as we get closer to the dates. And I just want the families out there and the educators out there and the people in this community out there to know that, I mean, we're going to have to keep looking at this and we're, we might have to make decisions with a week to go, with two weeks to go, that may change what you and your family have to do. But if it's the right thing to do, I think that, I think that we should understand that, um, that, that it's necessary if we have to go from in person to remote or we decide to go in person and have to go back to remote or vice versa. Um, I just think that that even if it's with a week or two to go, I think we have to be ready to make those those changes when necessary. And that's me babbling on for a little bit too long, but um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Ethan. All right, so we've heard a lot of different points of view here and a lot of different perspectives. Um, honestly, I think, it, you know, if the question is, do we need to approve the three plans that we have? I think, you know, I guess a question to the committee is, with the plans as they stand now, um, knowing that there are highlighted areas that need some enhancement, but the work that's gone into clarifying um, outstanding questions, including placeholders for things like, um, uh, I think there was even a question tonight about uh, how you address if we are in person with tents and inclement weather and all of that. But I feel like we have a strong structure for all three plans, but I'd like to hear your input on that in terms of at least settling, do we feel like we have three plans upon which we can use to evaluate which of those we recommend um, for a for a fall start. Can I um, make a comment and then ask some clarifying questions probably to, to Annie? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I hear everybody's different perspective is just on the committee as well. And I think the thing that I keep struggling with that brings me back to remote is that um, a very large population, which is our students, have been remote in Massachusetts since March 13th. And I think it's really important to look at data and be data driven and make our decisions based on, based on data. Um, but I think having um, this large cohort beyond Hadley, just the state of Massachusetts alone, all going back to school in some shape or form, whether it be full time in person or hybrid or whatnot, um, I worry about the shift in the data very quickly. Um, and I think that's why I worry about having a more conservative approach um, because there are districts in the state that are going to be going hybrid and going back. And I would rather us um, start out remote and watch those numbers given we have 
had our students in Massachusetts out of school for just so long. I worry about waiting to say, well, UMass is coming back or all any of the surrounding colleges with the delay time um, of getting that data from when a person is infected to showing symptoms to tests and then the data coming out. Um, I worry that at that point we've waited too long and any impact that we might have would be lost at that point. Just, I wanted to clarify that. I, it's such a struggle. Um, but with that, Annie, I have two questions. Um, one is, and I don't know if you can answer all this, um, do we have an idea percentage-wise um, of how many districts in the state are starting um, either remote completely or hybrid? Like percentage-wise, your best guess. I know that's a random question, but I'm just curious, like, because a lot of what I'm seeing right now is that most districts, at least publicly, um, that are announcing their plans, I'm seeing a lot of hybrid and I'm seeing a lot of remote but I haven't seen a lot of plans that are starting in person um, phased in. I'm just curious. Yeah, so um, roughly now I'm quoting uh, the percentages that the commissioner referred to on a phone call this week. So I'm not quoting a data source, but a conversation. In that conversation, he said that his numbers to date, that roughly 10% of districts in the Commonwealth uh, had decided or were leaning to starting completely remote. The large majority of them were starting with a hybrid approach. And so that would be your larger bell curve in the middle. I yep, feel yep. like, gosh, I wanna say that that was about 80. So it was like 10 and 10 and then 80 in the middle around hybrid. Um, I just wanna clarify for the public though in the committee, remember that in many cases, and Terry, you brought up a very good point that just all at once, five days a week, feels unsettling for you, which makes perfect sense. But I just want the, the public to understand that in hybrids, uh, one of the primary reasons that many districts have elected hybrid is because they could not physically fit 100% of their students in their schools at six feet, even if they repurposed learning spaces. So they had no choice. So for example, I believe that where, I believe where school committee has either voted or is looking to um, do 100% in person for the middle and high school because they can fit 100% of the children in the building at six feet um, and then a hybrid at the elementary school. Even in a hybrid approach, People just have to be really mindful. This is my personal uh, bug of boo, so my personal opinion. But then I'll say again, none of this work is ever wasted work. Uh, we feel good about giving the committee good information to make a difficult decision, but at least information to be able to make a decision. So um, whatever the committee decides, uh, we'll, we'll do what we need to do and, and to the extent that that affects working conditions that will and must be negotiated. Um, but in hybrids, remember that if you don't cohort students, and I'm not saying you're suggesting that we then forget about cohorting. If you don't, when we hear about hybrid models in which high schools continue to run their traditional schedule, all of those students will mix. And just ask yourself how many trans transitions occur on a, on a traditional block schedule there's three transitions to classes plus your transition to lunch. Take one positive student case, assume that student went to all those classes, make them as small as you like. If you had to hybrid, so maybe there are 15 in there, 15 times three plus everybody at lunch. So just, just people always have to keep that in mind that hybrid, if you, if you don't take into consideration group distancing, you are still going to have a, a big, potentially a large group of folks that need to be isolated. So that was just one element of that in-person plan um, that a hybrid can still be fewer students and you keep group distancing. The school committee could say group distancing is not our priority. We want something else, but I just really want people to understand and be clear um, that the group distancing and breaking social transmission chains is not talked about much at all. And there are a whole host of hybrid plans right now across the Commonwealth in which high school students retain their regular schedule. 
to get to That's your true. original yeah. question, Heather, um, I think our team did a really great job with the plan. I, I like the cohort model. I think it prevents mixing from room to, to room. I like the focus on using one-to-one -one laptops um, and providing that to students to, that don't have it. I like the fact that we would be having educators using um, those tools, those electronic medium, Google uh, Classroom, Zoom, various other things to um, get all students in their class, both the ones in front of them, as well as the ones online, to uh, utilize those tools as a, as a repository of information and also experimenting with better online teaching mechanisms that all students get to utilize. And I do feel right now that there's a little bit too much disparity between what's happening in the in-person environment and what's happening in the remote environment. I don't feel that it's equal. And in any other situation, if there were 30% of the population that were going to be left behind because, and it was sort of, you know, less than that we wouldn't be, that we wouldn't allow for that, that that would not be something that would be acceptable for us. So uh, I would be in favor of, um, if we were to vote, and I'm in, I'm in favor of not rushing into things. Remember, I was the one who said, let's delay the vote. Let's get more information. Let's focus on um, getting better on the plan uh, because uh, no need to rush things here. But I would be in favor of agreeing to a remote start with the Hadley Education Association and our administration coming back with a recommendation on what the um, metrics are for kicking us into a, uh, an in-person scenario and a revised plan based on the feedback that we're hearing tonight that, you know, that, that in-person scenario could look different than the one that's been described in the plan today. Um, so, I mean, you know, frankly speaking, we have five members of the team, three of whom led with remote and two who did not, if we were to take a vote today, we would be at remote. It would not be satisfactory because we're all sort of not, it's not a perfect plan. But if you're looking for a vote, then we could make it and ask our educators to improve the plans even further. And I think our educators would rise to the occasion to make a very strong remote plan and make a, help us make a more informed decision as we get closer to the start of school. Mara, a question for you. Um, with what you described, a, a remote start and then come back after consideration, deliberation, begin that in person. Um, are you, what do you think about the in person cohort model? So, looking at that graphic where we had two phased in approaches, it would really be the one on the right, which is start with remote, then come back in person with the cohort, with the, the leaving at noontime, essentially, and so on. Is that what you're envisioning? I'm envisioning that we would, you know, honestly, I think that we need to be thinking about if you start that cohort, start, it, start them in the online environment, have them get to, you know, as teachers get to know their students, as students get to know one another, uh, what, what would that look like? what would those classes look like in the online environment so that when they are in person, they could not miss a beat and be in that cohort model. And, you know, if we do have to shut down again in December, that it does, uh, that there is that structure already in place. I don't think that we've, you know, I think there's a lot more um, scenario planning that we need to do. But yeah, I believe that starting remote we would have to come up with some kind of metric that said well we're going to we're going to give it at least a month or two to see what it does to have what is it 6000 or 22000 umass students back in our neighborhood 
what it's going to what what that's going to do to the numbers and be able to make an informed decision at that time what is our is it the number still at one percent one point one in change uh, are we on an uptick as we are in massachusetts today um and that we figure out what that threshold is for us to say okay this is safe let's start at that first in-person stage so thank you. And Annie, or maybe April, um, a question about the first in-person stage, if we're looking at the scenario on the right. So you have students all attending classes remotely using whatever online tools that they're using. Now we're in the, the fortunate ability to bring people back and they're in that cohort model that's described in detail in the school plans. Are, is the learning for, I guess, really two questions. For the kids who, whose families have chosen not to bring them back in in person and to continue with remote learning. Would that look just the same for those kids in terms of how they interact with their teachers, how they engage in the learning? Would it be kind of a continuity of educational um, environment, just they're not coming back to the building while some of their um, friends may be? And then for the people who are coming back into the building in this phase two, um, beginning with remote learning, are they sitting in their assigned seat all day getting some live instruction from whoever is potentially in their classroom and then the rest through their device with, you know, the Google Classroom? So Sorry. April, I can, I can start and where I go off the rails, you can, you can jump right in, truly. So just one thing that I, I want to make really clear. So if, if the entire district were remote, for the first six weeks. And then um, we had a, uh, some established metrics that we looked at to made it, make a determination about entering what then becomes phase two, which is a cohorted model, Monday through Friday still, and early dismissal with lunches grab and go. And at the elementary school, specials are taught in the afternoon. Students are in, which elementary students are naturally usually cohorted by a, they're in one class for most of the day. So we keep the cohort intact at the elementary school by teaching specials, um, or I would say essentials, but music, art, and PE remotely Monday through Friday. At the high school, which is I think where you're getting, where more of your question's coming from, uh, Heather, is that I just, I, I wanna be really clear. Again, this would, it's, everything needs to and must be negotiated with the staff. But I just want, I want people to have realistic expectations. And this isn't about trying to say that, uh, that folks don't want to work incredibly hard. My goodness, our staff works incredibly hard. But just to think about if students return to that cohorted model, and there's somebody with them that is responsible for trying to ease them back into um, school in person, help them be a contact person, facilitate um, interactions, live interactions with their content teachers. But the idea that when the students are at home and the entire district is remote, the teachers will follow the schedule, will teach in according to the schedule. Now when you have students return and you have some students home, we are not advocating at this point that teachers would walk around with cameras and, and microphones on their lapels all day long. And I'm not suggesting that anybody here is advocating that, but just I'm just trying to be completely clear that it not necessarily, I don't want people thinking that a teacher who's standing in front of students and working with students that they are also going to have students who are at home logging in and viewing that experience live. So I, so it would not, it would not necessarily be the same. Um, and that, that, that could not occur without um, the consent and agreement of the faculty and the staff. And when I say that, I'm not implying that they would ever, ever resist anything for the sake of being obstructionist. I know I don't have to say that to this 
community or this committee, but I'm just saying it for the public. Um, when they say pause, it's because they really want to make sure that they're doing their work well. And if I were a teacher, a part of me would have a very deep and legitimate concern that there's this expectation that's being created that I, I'm, I'm doing both of these simultaneously equally effectively. And I can't, and I defer, Humara, I will say straight out, obviously, you know far more about this than I do. So I'm just saying this on behalf of some educators, maybe no educators, but I'm saying if I, if I were hearing the idea that maybe people might expect that I'm giving my all to a classroom of students who are in front of me and simultaneously I'm monitoring a group of students that are out remotely, that would just feel wildly stressful to me. So I just want to be clear about an expectation as a starting point. Um, and April, you probably could have answered that question way more succinctly, but I just had to get that out. I, no, just I, to, I think that I'm sorry, it. April, before you start, I, I'm not making a commentary at all on the dedication or not dedication of any educator, believe me. What I'm just trying to understand is the student experience, if they begin remotely, which we have been, um, many of us have been discussing, and then we come back to a cohort model for those families who choose not to send their child back into school in this phase two. What is that student's experience from the remote perspective? Because if we need to say now that this phase two, you should not expect the same remote learning experience as you had in phase one. I just want to, I want to be out up front about that and say that now, but I'm sorry, um, April, go ahead. That's fine. Uh, I mean, at risk of, uh, Annie, you can cut me off if you need to also this time, but I guess I, I would say at risk of saying the wrong thing that, that yes, that, that's the case. So students, if they all begin 100% remote, for once students re-enter in person, the students that continue as remote would not get the same exact thing because as, as Annie was saying, the teachers that are there with students in remote hours will be doing different things than they were previously doing. And we can't get into what those things would be or how much potential synchronous versus asynchronous time would be. The asynchronous pieces that they were doing though would be the same. Mm -hmm. So the entire way through, no matter what, right? Uh, teachers, we've already discussed with teachers using Google Classroom, providing all of your lessons, um, unit outlines are equivalent of a unit outline and activities and assessments, right? All of those things will be on Google Classroom for everybody. So the asynchronous piece would stay the same, but the synchronous piece is likely what would be different in those two environments. And at Hopkins, they're doing something even more different, right? Because you couldn't just, in the cohort model anyway, you can't just, even if we could, <laughs> which we're not going to, we're not saying this, but if we could record teachers all day long, uh, which many of us would not agree to for many reasons, it wouldn't be teaching AP literature. You would be with a cohort of students, some of whom might not be any of your students, and you're working with those students, right? So as a student in the room, so if a student's in um, Ms. Roberts' room, I think, I can't remember, I think I gave her ninth graders, right? It would be one of her ninth graders, that she would normally have, but it wouldn't be her actual FG block class. Uh, but then other people who have uh, Ms. Sousey, for example, might not have her for anything, but that's their cohort teacher. So it, it is a little bit different. Um, and again, we just can't get into what those specifics are because that's where we're talking about working conditions. Can, if I may comment, um, it, it um, given the fact that 63% of educators are willing to invest in their learning and come out the other end with solutions that could really meet the needs of their remote learners and the in-person learners who are not going, who are gonna be in school, but not in the same classroom as them. Mm -hmm. That, that is something I think if 63% of educators are willing to invest in, 
then we can aspire to have a more equivalent experience. And that's not what I've heard. And I understand the reluctance to speak for educators and not hold the bar high, but I think they're holding the bar high for themselves and they wanna be safe. So I suspect if we give some runway to imagining, investing, learning, and designing that they could start the year off with a remote, it started strong and continue the assets and the innovation techniques that they've created into the in-person environment. Because frankly speaking, this cohort model, I mean, what I like to think of it is a mashup between the home run teacher and a guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. It's a person who's gonna be with you in class all day long. And they're just gonna make sure you're okay. But they also have their own classes and they're gonna have their online learners and they're gonna have in-person learners who are downstairs or down the hall, right? So it's gonna be a rare occurrence that they're going to be actually giving a live lecture. In the instance that they do, it's that online learner that's gonna get shafted. And what I'm suggesting is that no one gets shafted, that we can find, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm yeah, not saying yeah, that yeah. you're suggesting that someone should get yeah. shafted. Yeah. I'm just using very plain language to describe a scenario that we can arrive at where educators imagine an online experience that they then continue when in-person starts mm -hmm. because their students are not gonna be in their physical classroom anyways. And one model is that they have a camera strapped to their head, a GoPro, it's ridiculous. I don't know, some people do that in, in the college environment. Some educators might choose to do that, that they might want to actually create video assets of a lecture they're going to give anyways. They might choose to do it differently. Whatever it is, we ha I, I think we just need to put more time and energy into imagining it. And we clearly haven't because, because we're rushing to make a decision. And that's why I would be in favor of delaying the decision to give educators more of an opportunity to think about those scenarios, to, for, to give our administration more of a chance to negotiate and have some of those conversations. Because if given the opportunity to be safe and innovate or have risk and, uh, and not, I think they would choose to be safe and innovate. I think that is the win-win situation here. So that's, I, that's another way, Heather, that I'm, I, I choose to answer your question in that way. Can I just clarify two points? Just, uh, there's points of confusion, I think. So um, the, the piece about the lessons and the live lessons and the remote learners wouldn't get that piece. I think there's a point of confusion around that. We're not saying that students couldn't potentially have that opportunity or that a teacher couldn't choose to do that. So if a teacher chose to, to have a, a discussion because time allowed for it or to record a lesson, those are conversations that have been had. Um, we just haven't finalized all those different types of details with the HEA at this time, but any teacher, even if, even if the HEA said, we don't want to agree to any of these things, any teacher could still decide, I want to do this thing, right? To your point, yeah. they can create and innovate however they want, as long as we have the appropriate consent forms completed. Um, so those are things that have, in fact, been discussed. My point is simply uh, a basics of time, right? So when they return and they have you know, students in person, you don't have the same open availability for synchronous time that you might potentially have when everyone's 100%. So it's not saying that it couldn't exist at all. It's just that it couldn't be exactly the same um, because of that. And because of, as, as you noted, you're working with that group of students in the room as well, which if we were 100% remote, wouldn't be in the space with you. So that's all, it's just, it's just more that piece and not saying that anyone's saying, no, these things absolutely can't happen. Um, it's, it's more your point that those details haven't been ironed out. Right. Can I ask a, like a, a, clear, like a question to, to Jennifer and April about, about the, 
the difference in schedules, 100% remote versus kind of we're back at school and still, you know, we're at the half day program. It, I mean, I'm sure you guys have thought about it, but I'm just going to ask it, giving a thought to replicating the in-person schedule, that half day schedule to 1 p.m. to to the, the remote pro, like the remote program so that when you return to in-person, there's not really a change. I'm, maybe I'm thinking in completely wrong direction, but could we have the same schedule? I know it's, it's not necessarily the best schedule per se for time, but like to have that half day and then have that, that asynchronous work in the afternoon. You mean following? Following the schedule that you would have in uh, phase one or phase two that, half day, um, stay in the room, go on Google Classroom, do your work. Why is the schedule different remote if that's the in-person? It's not, it's the same exact schedule. Okay. Yeah, whatever schedule is happening in the school at the time, so even if it switched to a full day, at least the AJ, uh, Jen might have to speak for AGS, at least the AJ, uh, the students who are at home are following that exact schedule as well. So, but I'm talking, I'm talking about like the full remote, like the 100% remote plan is different than the in-person, right? The schedule-wise? Yeah. Yes, uh, oh, yes, slightly at yes, because we're naturally cohorted. So right. So when theoretically, depending on what the numbers would have been, if you had you know seventy five percent of your students in front of you um, teaching third grade, you would be able to teach all of your content. We of course would try to be working and be mindful of the remote learning um, that was happening at home, um, and try to adhere to some kind of schedule. But we. Those are things that we would have to negotiate and work with with our staff around. Um, and our staff does always think outside the box. We're constantly trying to figure out how we could meet the needs of every single child, special ed, ELL, um, you know, kids that are home, going to be remote, going to be an in-person. So a lot of work and, and conversations have already happened around this. Um, so, but to answer your question, we would have a, a schedule that would follow the remote learners at home. There would be some hopefully opportunity, and I don't know what that would look like yet, because again, that's a negotiating point. You're changing somebody's work um, conditions, and you wanna make sure that people have enough time for professional development, for collaboration, for being prepared. Um, but we would want those synchronous times um, as much as possible. I would think of something like a morning meeting would be lovely to have um, with our youngest students. And if they were remote, they would be able to participate in some type of morning meeting, say our kindergarten or our first grade, right? That's a wonderful time for the um, just socializing and sharing and, and the things that those students look forward to. Um, so we would want to do something like that. But again, you know, you only have one teacher and, and to split them in two, to have them accessible for the remote teacher, uh, remote students, and also in person, that's a lot to ask. Um, so we'd be, have to be creative around staffing. What other supports would we need? It would cost money, potentially. Um, so it, 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 is, it is something that we're talking about um, and we'll continue to do so. However, the school committee votes. Can I ask, Ethan, I, I just wanna clarify if this, I, just to be a little more clear so please you've got it no i maybe i'm not understanding it but i just want to make sure it's clear um so when kids go back to school for specifically for hes this is a little bit different for hopkins but for hes if you've got this schedule where you've got these kids that are coming in person are you kind of asking if it could be like they're flipping the schedule around for the remote learners in the teacher's perspective? So for instance, the teacher in the morning would teach the kids in person, and then in the afternoon, the teacher would teach the remote learners the same lesson? Is that no, what I'm not no, advocating that at all. No, 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 no I'm, I'm just not, trying not, to understand. No, I think, and I think honestly, my question is maybe more directed at, at, at Hopkins, where, you know, remembering what was talked about at the last meeting about how when we return to in-person, kids are gonna be sitting in one classroom all day for a half a day, going through their classroom in Google, in Google Classroom. Uh -huh. why, why, I guess, my, and again, I, I get the HES is gonna be very different. It, they're already cohorted. It's, it, it's, it's, I'm focusing more on Hopkins Academy. Why is the 
completely remote schedule different than the in-person schedule because in my mind and I could yeah. be wrong it would be an easier transition to keep for the remote kids that stay remote if the schedules were the same does that make sense yes I understand it now sorry <laughs> I got, that's okay I, I obviously didn't um, explain it well uh, I don't know. I guess when we thought about it, we just thought about the the full day um, instead. So, yeah, I don't know. We just, we didn't think about it like that. Because the other point that I'm not sure you're making uh, that I guess you could consider with that too would be that if it's hard for them to sit in one room as well, you know, it you're kind of doing that at home also. Might be a little bit more comfortable at home. Um, but part of the reason of not doing the, the full straight day with your teacher was also to give a little bit of a uh, break and then access to other staff or um, independent time for certain tasks. But I don't, we just haven't considered it. So. And the only reason I ask is because I feel like a lot of the parent, the parent comments have been about the remote learning feeling different, looking different. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be robust enough? And in my mind, this kind of makes it stay the same like if it's robust from the start it will continue to be robust even if you know say 60 to 70 percent of the kids go back into the classroom those kids that are remote are going to still get the same learning i guess but i you know I, I i get that there's challenges around that hey april so can i ask a question just so with the cohort model phase one a student goes in they're in there half a day what percentage of that morning for that block are they taking classes online uh well the they're the whole morning and there's about half an hour for math breaks total so from the time they get in there at 7 40 until they leave at noon um and then there's the the math breaks that they have in the morning time which add up to half an hour that being said you know how a teacher designs the tasks that they're doing during that time can vary um and there's also language in the plan too that suggests you know if you're in your a block and you're doing the course and you're trying to finish an assessment or whatever it may be the the goal of the cohort teacher is to just sort of coach and remind and support you that if you need to finish that they finish it and then remind them that they have to move on to the next material um so the vast majority of the time for that block that four or five hour block they're online they're absolutely yeah, the, whole, the whole time unless the teacher has given them something that's not right so, if a teacher so, so this them, is i guess this i'm going this is ethan's point right if you're home or you're in the room there's a difference but from a pedagog, I mean, from a, a curriculum perspective, why should there be a difference? Yeah, and it and it is the same, right? Because they're going to have the same things in Google Classroom. The so difference would be if students are home and they're in the cohort, the opportunity for synchronous time might be less than if everybody's 100%. That's where the difference is in the synchronous time, not the asynchronous time. And then maybe if I get to the Humera, your point is, are there technological ways to even loop in some of that? I get, I get confused when you talk about synchrony and asynchrony uh, time. The time where the teacher is, is teaching, you could have a camera on that teacher and the person at home could be watching just as the person in the back of the room is watching. Yeah, and uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating for that. I just bring it up because Annie brought it up. I, and I know other, ed other people, educators in the community have brought it up because it's a model that's worked for academic institutions. But if we're spending $70,000 on air purifiers, we could probably spend some thousands of dollars on video equipment and there's no doubt harmonize that at home and in class experience. There's no doubt. And I'm not advocating for it. Some educators may want to do it. Some educators may not. And I know what Annie's recognizing is that the issue is complex and it is, comes down to a bargaining, a collective bargaining. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a union educator issue. They'd have to agree to it. I believe that educators want to stay safe and therefore are willing to explore the models that make sense for their discipline, for their learner's age, for, you know, for, for their you, you specific circumstances. And I just don't think that we have, um, no matter what, we have to build out this online platform because we're going to need it in the in-person environment. And I don't think that we're going to get really good at it unless we say we're starting online and unless we say, let's build a plan and let's review it. And that's for all those reasons, I would be in favor of 
delaying a vote. And I just saw online that uh, the state is get now giving us until Friday the 14th instead of their original deadline of whatever the 10th. Um, I don't wanna kick the can down the street, but I do know that this is more complex than we originally imagined. I will say that again, because of all the reasons that we are, students are gonna be learning in the online environment and we need to get really good at being able to use these online tools, understand the pedagogy of using Google Classroom or Zoom or whatever it is that we're using, we should start there. We should start there for PD, we should start there in the online environment, and then moving in person while the synchronous and asynchronous times are gonna change because some kids are gonna be getting off a bus or be driven by their class and they're all gonna to have to wash their hands and bathroom breaks are different at home than they are in school. And so the schedule itself, of course, will have to change. And You've got these two hours in the afternoon that people will be focusing on content creation and grading and all that other stuff. It's, it's gonna look different than if educators are home. But I just, I know that there's a lot of unknowns still. And we should know those knowns. Let's plan. Let's imagine that together. Let's get really good at what we're doing um, and not run hastily into a decision. I'm, that's, I think that we, I'm hearing more support for starting remote and I'm also feeling a community realization that we need to understand online education better, remote education better. So, Humera, you said a couple things that I, I really resonate with me because I think 100% agreement. Um, when I look at the cohort plan, which I wholeheartedly endorse, what it says to me though is we're keeping the kids safe by keeping them in their pods, but in their cohorts, but they're still getting online instruction, right? They're getting online instruction, which is great. And they're, but they're with their peers and they're able to have the social interaction and be in school as normal as possible. I am all for that, but I feel like they're getting online instruction. So the safety part of me and the let's do this right part of me thinks start with the online instruction, get that right. And then now let's see that same engagement now in a classroom environment where they're still getting online instruction. Uh, so that's that's the perspective I'm coming from when I feel like at least then from an administration perspective and from the educators perspective, you don't feel like you're being stretched in four different ways where, okay, I'm coming back in person September 14th or, or 10 days before I need to have all of my in person plans ready while also delivering online instruction in person to the kids that are down the hall, while also serving the families who have chosen to keep their kids at home. So to me, that seems like the most difficult plan possible. And whereas you could say, I'm coming back 10 days before September 14th and I am committed to getting 100% online instruction right. I got my schedule, I got my class, I can see all of their smiling faces on the screen and they're together again as a class you know the three kids who chose to take ap calculus that, that we saw these these class sizes some of them are very small now those three are together taking ap calculus together online rather than being in three separate classrooms all with headphones on and is sitting in front of a screen and not really seeing each other i don't know that's that's my reaction to it so i i feel like we can really get that right and then translate that to the classroom if I can interject to, and I'm not suggesting that anybody is willfully neglecting anything, but this, the conversation also is really very specific to the high school. So students starting remote and then going back into in-person, they're still learning remote. That is completely different for the elementary school. Um, and so I'd like to close the gap a little bit too. And I know that that's challenging and I know that they're in a cohort in the elementary school, but that still doesn't address the remote learners in the elementary school and trying to close that gap. And I know it's challenging and I know it's hard to stress teachers and I know that there's union obligations, but I still wanna make sure that 
I think it's great to have these thoughts about the high school and how to close that gap, but we need to think in a completely different light on how to do that in an elementary school, which looks very different. So I just want to be sure that, and I'm not suggesting that you're neglecting the elementary school at all. I mean, um, but just making sure that we're thinking about those remote learners in the elementary school as well. Because what I don't want to do is in this time, which is a completely um, unprecedented time that none of us could imagine we're going to be in, um, I wouldn't want to make remote learners or parents of remote learners feel uncomfortable with their decision of choosing remote when they're making the best decision for their family for safety purposes. So I just think it's important to look at the elementary school as well and how we can close that gap. I have no idea how that looks. I really don't. Um, but Thank back to it. That, Tara. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But back to it, what I'm understanding too is that these are ongoing conversations. And Annie, I, I think I had asked the question last time, at any point in time we can change any of our plans. So if we decide on a phased beginning with remote learning opening, if at our August 24th school committee meeting, we come up with some more information and we collaborate more and talk about how to improve things, we can kind of shift these things, right? We don't have to decide exactly what remote learning looks like right now, just that we're going to do this plan. It doesn't have to be the details of the plan or does it? So what would be helpful? So the uh, short answer to what your authority is, is that um, given the fact that you have the authority to choose now, I'm going to logically say, although I think you, Mary, makes a very good point, but I'm going to say logically, one would argue that um, you would, as a matter of fact, it has been stated already in the guidance that um, a school district may elect to close because of um, health concerns, school transmission or community transmission rates. However, we do, prior to closing, we have to communicate with um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and um, Department of Public Health. But you do have that authority. So yes, you can um, make decisions based on student and staff and community safety and um, you have the authority to do that. I would just, as a, as I, I appreciate the fact that people really want to be thoughtful, but I would ask that the committee just decide on where our focus is going to be. So essentially say, this is where I want you to start uh, the school year. Understanding that that could change, but that would be extremely helpful because even with the extension that came through, we need 48 hours to post a meeting. We need to put a packet together. We need to then do whatever we need to do and bring it back. It's, it's actually quite a condensed amount of time. But if we say, this is where we, if the school committee says, focus here, this is how you start the school year. Um, unless, again, you can revisit, but it would be nice to have. A, I, I'd very much appreciate that. Exiting here with a sense of where people want to be. Yeah, definitely. A question for you, because um, I don't think we've asked this before, and it's not clear to me from the guidance. If does the decision that we recommend need to be applied to both buildings or can somebody recommend, hey, we want to come back in person cohort in the elementary school and 100% online and Hopkins. I, I'm just, I, I'm throwing it out yes, there. Yes, you can do that. Yes, you can do that. You have the authority. We present, uh, we submit the plan and we present the rationale and you have the authority to do that. Um, now that again, these plans are ultimately subject to approval. I, I don't know what the consequences are if they're not approved or are approved. So the vote then gets submitted. The only thing that's changed in terms of regulations for time on learning is that student days have been reduced to 170 days next year. And the hours have been reduced somewhat too. But um, so the plan would need to, if we are short of, our total hours and 170 days, um, then we just have to have a compelling reason as to as to why we did that, which you've surfaced, you, you all have discussed many of those, but I know you're not suggesting this. I just wanna be clear for the public. We can't just, so we're not under new rules. Private schools, for example, a, a school like Hartsbrook, there are no time on learning uh, regulations that dictate those schools. They can go as many days as they want or not. Um, there are still 
regulations that, that uh, govern public schools. So we can't just for the sake of creating something, create something. Um, I know that's, I'm not saying that anyone is suggesting that, I just wanna be clear about that. But yes, you can have two different models for elementary and middle, and uh, Hopkins. Thank you. Hey, Paul, can I ask you a question about these air purifiers? I know you kind of, I just want to confirm, like we'll be able to get them all and get them installed in time for school opening? No, I can't commit to that, Ethan. That, that, I mean, that would be one of the benefits right, of, of going remote is we would most surely, I mean, the, the couple of folks I've talked to, they're, they said, well, we'll, you know, we'll try to push, you know, so yeah, that, that's a risk. We wouldn't open, I will say that, we wouldn't open in the absence of being able to do that. That's right. So I'm not sure if it's what you're suggesting, Heather, but I'm not, I'm not actually in favor of starting the two schools off in different plans. Um, I think that both schools should start the year off remotely. Um, I think that if our concern is safety and gathering more data as time goes on, that it would be short-sighted of us to say, for instance, start the elementary school off in person and start the high school off remotely. I think if, if our concern is safety and following data and wanting to take a slow approach, then both schools should be starting remotely. Thanks, Tara. Yeah, I, I wasn't really suggesting one way or another or understanding if that's even accepted. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Paul and Ethan, to, to your question, and this, again, is the part that I worry about disruption to families. So let's say we say tonight, you know, Annie, here's the clear direction. We want 100% um, the, the cohort model. I'm sorry. We want to come back in person cohort model. And then, you know, a week before we're told we don't have the safety equipment, the purifiers aren't in, you know, we're not ready. We can't do it. So now we're a week out and we're shifting gears. And I just, again, I just, I worry about rushing. You know, Humera has mentioned that a couple of times. We're rushing to make a recommendation, but I also feel like rushing to reopen a school where we, we aren't ready yet um, and we have lots of plans in place. That to me seems short-sighted than planning now, getting all of the things in place, getting the supports for the students who do remain at home. Um, and those supports in place and being able to serve everybody um, equitably to start uh, and to continue throughout the year. That's, that's where my, I guess, priority lies. And I, I, don't, I don't think I disagree. I, I think when it comes, I, just, I think I just want to make the point, and, and, and I agree, that's kind of why I asked the question about the purifiers and, you know, maybe we do need more time. I think I think the reality is that we're going to have disruptions regardless of the program we go with. I think at some point we're going to go forwards and some point we're going to go backwards. Um, and, and I just keep going back to that question. I know Paul Pope, uh, mentioned it and I mentioned it as well. Like we need to really establish what the thresholds are going to be for us to go into the next phase, because if not, we're going to continue to kind of have these roundabout conversations about what it looks like, what it feels like, um, and, and, I, and I do know that it's going to be taxing on the community because it's probably going to be conversations that happen in a, in a short period of time in a small space, maybe even in a vacuum, and then we're going to make these changes. But um, this is a unique time. It's a unique experience that we're going through. And I think we all have to be adaptable. Um, but I, I, to, I, again, I don't disagree with the idea that maybe we do need more time. Um, but I just think we, we can't expect that the minute we hit play on this that it's going to we're going to just go phase one through phase six and everything's going to look great um there, there are going to be bumps along the road what makes things more complex is the fact that the fall has these uh these obstacles okay so say we dive into learning how to educate well online i think that you know in an ideal world we'd have a couple of months of doing that and we'd have a couple of months of really getting it right, establishing rapport between the students and their educators, students getting into a groove, educators getting into a groove, right? And, and like really nailing this remote teaching thing. But that puts us right about just before Thanksgiving, which now gets into holidays, right? 
So we are potentially talking about sending kids back to school right after Thanksgiving, if the numbers look right. And, and yes, of course, there's cold and flu season and there's lots of complexities, but like generally that's what we're talking about. But one month just does not feel right to me. And in fact, it feels like um, it could be one of those things of like, oh, we're, we could just, we don't really have to change the way we teach because we're just going to be back to get, we're going to be together in person in a month. And I, I really, I worry that it like the whole plan would get short trip because, you know, people would just be like, well, it's just an extra month and I don't really have to do anything. I don't really have to get anything started anew in a month's time because we're going to be in changing it up again. So I don't really see any way around it. And if we don't like that, like Thanksgiving timeframe, then we're actually talking about starting after the first of the year. Where like it's either like that time frame to do it r like reasonably right or forward. In my view, it can't be any sooner. Now I think that's something that I our educators need to think about and come up with a plan and make a recommendation. But I don't think we have the data at this moment to say definitively uh, these these are the metrics that are going to kick us into the next phase and this is what what it would look like to do remote really well and start the year off strong i don't think we have that in front of us right now so if it would be like a motion to start remote and a request to figure out those details and come back with a more solid plan and we're constantly revisiting constantly every meeting revisiting yeah so figuring out the details about when those phases um what triggers a change in phase? What triggers a, a recommendation to start the cohort model in person? I think the reality is there's always gonna be that risk, right, Heather, until we have a, a vaccine that's through 50 to 60% of the population, right, which is next summer, you know, at the earliest, right? And so if, even if you're down to, I mean, we're at the lowest positivity rate probably gonna be in a while, right? So if we're not willing to go in person now, Probably not for a while. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, you know, I think you, you, there will see, be some sort of spike that we'll probably see with the, the college kids. Maybe that'll get reversed down. Um, but I can't imagine we're going to suddenly find ourselves much below one and a half or one, maybe. And so if that's the metric, but 1% risk is still a risk, right? And at 500 kids, you're still going to have five kids sick. So is that more acceptable than seven and a half kids sick? So that's the kind of, you're, we're going to have to come up with our 5% positivity is an arbitrary number, as we all know, right? So we're going to have to come up with some other, somewhat acceptable arbitrary number. Um, I guess, Humira, I, I appreciate, and I think we do need to improve remote learning. If we nail remote learning, it's still suboptimal to me. That's the fundamental thing that I just can't get past. You seem to, you, I seem to, you have much more passion for it. And I'm, I love your passion and your wisdom on this is, I, um, I just feel like no matter what we do, if we if we get the technology down and people are engaged, it's still not going to be great for. Uh, I know one of my children. It's going to be really poor for one a of my. A pandemic is suboptimal, and uh, so, and and, and so I, that risk is not gone. And right. I don't. Feel, so my feeling is that risk is, it's, it's 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 we're doing our best to manage it, and I don't think in six months or three months, well maybe with six months with a vaccine, it, it'll start going down. So I think we just need to, unless, and if somebody comes to me and says, no, at 1% positivity is when we go back in person, I just need to understand the logic associated with that, right? Because that's no, that's really very different, not very different than where we are now. I think the most compelling case you made, Heather, was yours. Like, so we know we're gonna have to do some remote learning. Let's take time to get into that and understand it's just gonna be suboptimal no matter what. Um, and, but I still, my, my flip side on that is no, it's, Everything's suboptimal. The least suboptimal is to have some people in person, even though it's it's not, they're not walking around, they're not socializing, but there's a value there that frankly, I don't think we can, we can quantify. That's what the American, you know, the, the Pediatrics Academy of Pediatrics says. I buy that because I see it in my kids. And so I think that there's a risk associated with that, but I'm like that risk right now is outweighing uh, the, the 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 benefits outweigh the risks that there and and I, again I'll come back to this I think that's where almost eighty percent of uh, the kids 
the parents according to the you know to the kids that they're going to send that's what they're saying too so i feel like that's compelling to me the other thing just to build on what you're saying paul i mean we could you're right it doesn't replace in-person instruction it really doesn't and therefore yes if if it were optimum then it is like suboptimum but we could throw in the towel and say it's suboptimum we don't really have to try hard as a result or we could say we really need to lean into this and make it as not suboptimum as possible and i think that framing is really important in setting the pathway for our work over the next that's what i'm saying lean into the in-person and build on that so i get it um and i mean so like I, I, I get it that that doesn't seem where the school committee is going. I do think we should vote. I do think we should be clear to, to families because if you read the comments on the surveys, people are struggling, right? This is going to set back some families significantly, right? But as Ethan said, no matter what we do, people are going to be affected, right? And so, um, so I, would, I would advocate we make a vote so that we're clear and that it's, um, you know, but then folks need to know when we're going to shift from that. And that's just going to be another debate about what maybe there's some creative metrics here that we haven't thought of that we can use. On that. And maybe it is just all about giving time. Maybe we just say, hey, look, if it's the same as it is now, it doesn't get any worse after six weeks, 12 weeks or whatever it is when the students come back, then we'll shift because then we'll feel comfortable that that bump either it happened in its past or it didn't happen or it's it's happened and it's so bad that thank goodness we're remote. I mean, that's all three of those are possible. I'd also like to see another survey, one that gets into a little bit greater detail about what families have to do. What, and I'd like to understand, you know, in terms of solving those equity issues, uh, if it were just limited to IEP, SPED, at risk, uh, and those, those um, families that just have to, because there's no human at home, uh, or the kid is at risk if that human is at home. I, I wanna get clear around that. I don't wanna know who, but I, I would like us to understand as a school system, the data around that. So if we, cause we just had a summer program, right? So what if there was a skeletal, you know, program for the people who are most at risk? I think we can ask ourselves, what would a win-win situation look like? So those, folks at home who are thinking, well, how am I gonna make ends meet? That we're helping solve a problem there too. Uh, I just don't, so I, I, that's what I, if we, if we vote tonight on remote, I'd like to vote for more data and I'd like for, to ask the administration to, um, to think more deeply about um, addressing some of those issues in the meantime. So what I'm also hearing is, um, with with a motion, if we were to vote for going back a hundred percent remote, we would also want to um, at least delineate for now what that initial time frame may be. So it's the thinking, as Paul said, was, hey, if things stay the way that they are now, six weeks of a hundred percent remote. After that, we'll go into in-person cohort. We're prepared to to say that based on what we know now. If this data stays the way it is now. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to support that because I, I do want to get there. This was not intended, you know, as a, I want to stay 100% remote. I want to get to in-person, but I also want to be able to have people focused uh, on making that remote learning right. Uh, so it, it, I would pair up emotion not only with what Humera, you framed in terms of um, ensuring that the data and information is available regarding um, students with needs uh, and services provided to those students, but as well as are we um, are we comfortable with that plan that was laid out on the right hand side of at least for now saying if a six week start for a 100% remote um, start is acceptable and we're at the current rate we are now with what we know now that that seems like a, a, a sound starting point. I don't know when the, 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 the switch gets flicked, Heather. I don't know that it's six weeks. 
that's that's the only thing that's my hesitation about voting on a plan in, that is in terms of a right hand column i know that starting remote is the safest i know that i need um a, a recommendation on um when that what that trigger is because it might not i, I just i don't have that information in front of me so and, I, and i would love the additional data about um in a in an environment where remote education was done really well and our equity issues were being solved in person um how many families and educators would support that i'd like to know that so i 100 percent um agree and stand by what you just said humera i think it's really hard for me to get on board with saying that um, I agree with the phase beginning with remote um, learning to start because I do feel like it ties us into that six weeks. Um, and Annie has indicated that if we do change our plan that we need to give, um, we need to provide information as to why we're changing that plan and who knows if it's subject to approval or not. But I just feel like there's just too many unknowns to lock us into that plan and that we do need more information and things are changing all the time. I mean, Smith College did just, um, uh, revoke their in-person. They're now doing remote and I just got a message from a parent who's actually listening right now that said UMass just announced that they're drastically cutting back the number of students that are going to be coming back in person and I just think even five to six weeks from now when we're starting school we're still going to have that much more information um, and a little bit not complete clarity but more clarity and more information that might be helpful for us to decide when it is appropriate and safe. So I'm concerned about tying us into six weeks and then starting phased in as well at least putting that time frame on it yeah, i would just advocate that we, we try to provide clarity to parents as much as possible right there was a lot of heartfelt comments in that survey about uh, the struggles that are going to happen by just all remote learning and, and tara if umass students are not coming back in force that i think that's even better right that's better for us frankly might not be better for our local economy but it's better from a, a contagion perspective I guess, Umera, I, I appreciate the, the thought of doing another survey. The question is, what if, what if you come back and parents still say 75, 80%, I want my kid there? So what are we going to do with that information? I would say more data is better than less data, Paul. Well, let's, ask, let's, let's make sure we know what we're going to do with the data when we ask. Right? And I think that we should be, I mean, I'm happy to um, help, our, uh, help us um, ask more information of the parents uh than we have i feel as though we have um like we have the decision needed to be black or white do you prefer do you, do you intend to send your kid to in-person versus do you not and i i just think that there's a lot of gray area there that we um it would behoove us to understand what that is so i'd like to understand I, I get. I think you're right. The questions have been pretty simplistic, and I think maybe there's some education then to paint that vision of what 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 you think online learning could be. And for somebody who spends seven hours a day on Zoom, you know, now twelve hours today on Zoom, right? It's 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 not the best forum for me, and I think that might be the only experience that a lot of parents have. So if you have a different vision, we should talk about that. Look, I don't support this. It's clear. I don't think we should go all remote. I think there's a lot of compelling arguments. Um, but it, if this is the way the school committee is going, I think we should be clear and tell parents that. Um, not give them false hope that if we do another survey, we might change our mind. Let's be clear about when we would change our mind. And so Humera and Tara, you know, I'm happy to help think creatively about when that shift would be. If this is the way we're going to go, I don't agree with it. But I'm, I can totally see the, the reason, totally see the reason, because this is a hard issue. And I'll do everything I can to make it successful. So that I just want us to be as clear as we can with, with parents tonight. Thank you, Paul. Um, I also just got a flash on my phone that Springfield Public Schools did say that their first grading period, so they gave a time bound around it, will be fully remote. Um, so again, a decision uh, and a time boundary. Um, I, I would like to ask that if there is a motion on this to support um, beginning the school year in 100% um, remote learning, that there is a commitment to 
uh, move towards in-person instruction. I'd like to pair that with the motion because I think I'm hearing the same thing from everybody that we are all committed to getting our kids back in the classrooms. Um, and the educators are committed to getting back in the classrooms as well. But um, it seems like with the feedback that we've received um, to start with the 100% remote, uh, I don't have an answer on the time boundary. I agree with you, Paul, we should be clear on that as to what we define that as. I don't know if we can pick that tonight. I don't know if we need to pick that tonight, but I think we should commit to, we're gonna define what that time frame is. That's good. That's what, maybe that's a better way to say it, right? I didn't necessarily think we can, we need to come up with something as clearly as, as quickly as we can. I like, you know, even that simple metric of Springfield is, is helpful. That would be essentially probably nine weeks, a quarter. Would you agree with that, April and Jen? It probably they're talking nine weeks. Which would put us around Thanksgiving? Is that what we're talking about? Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, depending on your start date, yeah, so roughly, right? So, it, I mean, it's consistent with what I was it's consistent with what I was proposing, which was that it was that we were giving it at least a couple of months. Um, and I, I kind of actually really like the the grading cycle because now you are you know, you have a full cycle of like getting started uh, teaching and also measuring that um, that that progress. That makes sense to me. I will say that's when most colleges are sending kids home, right? Because of their second wave of outbreak, they're concerned. So the likelihood of bringing kids back under that scenario seems a low. Uh, so, you know, I think you should be clear to parents. There's a possibility that this is going into the new year, like you said, Humara. So plan for whatever it is we would assess in two, three We months. can have a hypothesis. Yeah, I mean, right, I we can have a hypothesis. Other colleges are saying, so. Um, I think it's just hard if we, it, yeah, I, I like the clarity. So if we were to say one grading period that Andy gets us to Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving. I know we don't need to decide today, but I'm just. Sorry. It would be a little bit before. Thank you, April. The, the regular yeah. grading periods too are gonna have to be shorter because we have 10 days left in the school year. So normally a quarter is 45 days. Uh -huh. um, and so it, it would be a little bit before in November. Is there anything that we have to, in terms of these time frames, be conscious of in terms of the the union and the and the teachers about like, or if we do this first nine weeks or this first marking period, and we still don't feel comfortable, do we do we then have to go another marking period, or or I'm just thinking back to kind of our original idea of these six weeks, two virus cycles, and how at least it's it's kind of consistent. Whereas if we go a marking period, do we have to then commit to another marking period online if we're not yet comfortable? I think in terms of in terms of for the contract with the teachers. So anything national law 150 E is pretty straightforward that anything that constitutes a change in working conditions needs to be negotiated. So because this would be um, whatever the school committee recommends, then we would uh, develop a memorandum of understanding between the school committee and the union. I would spell out this is this a radical departure anything we would have done is a radical departure this is what we're doing um, and we do our very best uh, to try to take into to foresee all of the things that we need to account for but if there was something that was not spelled out in that MOU like it's hard to see everything up front right that um, hadn't been delineated in the MOU and represented a change in working conditions from the agreed upon contract um, or collective bargaining agreement then we that would be subject to additional negotiations so what would be helpful for me is to understand maybe just as i think about this are the logic i've heard about the lane there seems to be different categories of logic one is the viral transmission uh, students coming back increasing uh, one is consistency uh, you know that we would if we started out in person we most likely would go to remote that's inconsistent that's difficult One's about the disparity between the, the remote learners and the in-person in remoters. One's about sort of dovetail. So that is about taking time to increase our um, facility at remote learning. Let's do that now because eventually, even if we're in person, we're doing that remotely in, in 
some fashion. So it'd be helpful. Each of those could have their own metric or some consequence, right? So, you know, six weeks to me was, Heather's, you know, I think, you, you know, you brainstormed and sort of said that gives us time to get this down, gives us time to assess the, if there's a bump from the schools. Um, you know, so November is a different story. What are we doing there? That's, is that just focusing less on the virus and more on the pedagogy aspect? You know, so that'd be helpful for me to, the logic, I know we've been brainstorming, the logic's kind of gone around. So clarify, here's why we want to delay, because do remote learning. Here are the things that we're most concerned about. Here's what time is gonna allow us to figure out either how to do remote learning or virus or both. Uh, response from the students coming back are all three of those. Yeah, Paul, so the time frame piece seems to me more in line with the consistency of instruction. That if you say it's a grading period or if you say it's um, you know, the nine weeks that we just said, that is less about the virus cycle and to me more about I'm finishing out this course in one or this grading cycle in one modality. That's it. Um, before I then uh, pick up and go into the building, which is going to be a whole different experience for every different child. Um, so I, I kind of like that idea of not necessarily impacting somebody's grade because they shifted modalities in the middle of that grading period. That's not, so that's yeah. not any scientific data at all about virus rates or anything. I mean, but that is uh, maybe intended to be probably least impactful to those students in terms of um, the least amount of, we, you, I've said disruption, you're right, everything's going to be disruptive, but the least disruptive would be shifting mid midstream in the middle of a course and changing mechanisms, especially for the kids, again, who started remote and choose not to go back into the school building and now continue in remote, but it may look very different. Yeah. I, or an assumption is online learning is the most, is very disruptive for some. And we have 80% or 75% saying they want to be in person. So when they're not in person, they're being disrupted. Um, so the other, the counter argument to that is as soon as we can get them in person and if we feel safely based whatever metric that is, then we should do that even if that means mid-quarter. So maybe, uh, okay, so to go back to um, a motion for this, can we say that we, <laughs> we will determine what that time frame is, whether that is based on, I mean, we've talked about health metrics, safety metrics, building readiness metrics, um, coursework or course timeline metrics, all of those things are being taken into consideration. But I, what I'm hearing is our commitment to get kids back into the school. I don't think that we're saying as fast as humanly possible, because otherwise that would be our, our start plan. But I think what we're saying is as, as safe and as possible and as equitably as possible. Yes. That's you need to flesh that out a little bit. I think that is what you're saying. It's just sort of, what does that mean? Because I think that means something different to everybody. Right. right. All of this does, yeah. So. Yep. So I think, I think it's safe to say that we could have a motion to start remotely and aspire to be back in person studying the various metrics and getting a recommendation from our administration and educators on which things trigger us to go back into an in-person environment and in what way. And that's something that we look at uh, every meeting from here forward. I would support that motion. What do others think? Does somebody want to second that? Do you want to add something to that? Amend it? I'm just thinking about, um, I, I like it. I'm just thinking about what Paul was saying, giving parents a time frame, at least in the beginning. Is there a way that we can amend it, giving, even if it's somewhat broad, a little bit of an idea as to when? And if it turns out that it's sooner than we expected, then, then that's great. But giving parents an idea of how long it could potentially be? I would amend it by saying that it would be the first grading quarter unless we find that uh, that 
there's a very strong case for safe in-person education, in which case we would speed it up and people could choose to stay remote if they you wanted to. What that means. You had 75% of the families that there's a very strong argument to go in person. So how many more percentage of family members do you need? Well, if it's the first quarter, if it's the first grading cycle, and we can go back feasibly, then it's a delightful surprise. I think after the first quarter, it really does need to be based on data. And we spend the 24th, the 31st, or subsequent meetings figuring out what safe does mean. Because it seems like that there's just too much up in the air to make that decision right now. So if we commit to the first quarter with the potential to go back sooner if things change, but that if we go through the first quarter, that it would be made on whatever um, whatever data points, we, whatever metrics we decide are appropriate and safe. So that potentially breaks Heather's logic, was sound logic that you would be disrupting kids by changing course midstream. Which, which was always the initial plan, right? We were, the plan was to do a six week. I mean, I just think about like the, 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 the six weeks is basically giving us almost 12 weeks at this point, right? Six weeks to the start of school, six weeks from the, the start of school. So we would, that would give us as, as, a, as a school committee, as an administration, as a community, 12 weeks to kind of flesh this whole thing out. Um, and I, I feel like that's enough time. Again, I, I can't help thinking that like, we keep talking about what that data metrics are gonna be. And, 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 I, and I find myself leaning toward a, 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 an open, that's, that's fully remote, but the data suggests in this moment that we could potentially open in person. I know the data is probably going to trend in a different direction over the next six weeks, um, but with the data from the community, but all in, in, in the data, you know, the COVID cases as it stands, I just keep thinking about like, what is going to be the data points? What is gonna be the threshold? I, I, I wanna believe that we're going to be able to come to that decision, um, but if, if the numbers that are presented right now aren't good enough, um, what are the good, what numbers are going to be good enough? And I guess that's just what keeps running through my head because if, if I'm thinking 12 weeks from now, if I'm thinking three months from now, you know, and maybe we're meeting a, a month and, you know, we're going to meet obviously a, a lot during this time, but like at what point are we going to say, this is good enough? Right. And, 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 to, and then say to the community, get yourselves ready. And then if, and then also what number is not good enough? Right, because we haven't even determined what number is not good enough. We're just saying right now it's not good enough, even though I would say by most metrics it is good enough. Um, and that, and I know that's, again, I'm, I'm assuming that there's risk involved, because, but I'm also assuming that the minute the kids go back for this next year, there's risk involved. There's, there is going to be risk involved until there's a vaccine and everyone has that vaccine. Um, so I, 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 I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm leaning towards supporting remote to start those first, I just think we should stick to the six weeks because I think it gives us a little bit more flexibility. Whereas if we go quarter, we're getting close to Thanksgiving. And then what, you know, then do we adjust to six weeks or, you know, we're going to have to go, I assume two virus cycles because it's been recommended. I, I just, I think, you know, I think, I just keep thinking about the data. We, you know, we talked about doing this based on data, based on science. And most of this conversation has been about assumptive data, like what we think is going to happen. And I, and I worry that that's not going to change. And there's nothing wrong with that to some extent, but we really have to figure out where's the threshold, both positive and negative. Like what's the lowest number that, we, uh, that we're gonna send our kids back, but then also when are we gonna pull them out? And what number are we gonna pull them out? Because we've been talking about when are we gonna get them back into school, but then we have to have the conversation about when are we gonna pull them back out of school? And I know this is, probably opening up a whole nother can of worms, but we keep kind of going well, back and forth on this. It's timely. I mean, I read an article today that talked about 2% being used as a metric. And, you know, that's, we're talking about five. And it's, it, we're talking about a tolerance for something that is, you know, potentially deadly. I mean, in my opinion, you know, one child getting sick or dying or anybody dying from this is no threshold that I, I don't, I don't want to see that. None of us want to see that. So it, it's hard to choose numbers and decide what we're okay with here. Um, you know, as to whether it's six weeks or whether it's a grading quarter to go back to time frame, uh, I like the concept of not potentially impacting somebody's grade by moving them in a different mode. 
that was the only thought that I had about when I saw that flash up, I was like, okay, that makes sense. It's a grading cycle. And thinking about some of the, you know, uh, any of the classes, right? To have some, uh, to have all of the impacts right now that students have already, and then to add this shift in the middle, that may be even, just even more detrimental. And I just advocate, I know I'm not really supposed to speak right now, but for my, my youngest learners, you know, the grading quarter might be something that we just want to look at for students that are five, six, seven years old. And if it were to be six weeks and we could re reassess um, and get kids in as soon as possible versus waiting a whole um, quarter until Thanksgiving. I mean, I just, as a parent too, if my child's not responding to online learning, um, instead of worrying about disrupting in older students term, because they're already set with online learning, on the flip side, children that aren't doing well um, and haven't been engaged and aren't, you know, their families have to go work and they're home alone. You know, those are the things that we have to be thinking about too. So it's just something to think about. And maybe it's not, maybe it's not one size fits all. Maybe at Hopkins, you could do something where um, you're looking at a full term. Um, again, that would have to be negotiated because we also want to make sure that our staffs are, are feeling supported as well. So just something I had to say for, for our littlest children. No, thank you. And I, I, I mean, I appreciate the perspective, Jennifer, because I, um, I don't want to only have our opinions sound like they're coming to one building or to the other building. I agree. We have to think about this across um, all learners within the district, for sure. So to go back to emotion, can we say, you know, um, up to, I don't know, a minimum of six weeks? Can we say something like that to at least set the expectations that we are looking at a six week initial online? Do we need to be that specific tonight? Or is that, I think everybody's hearing us say this, that we're talking about six weeks versus if it were a quarter now with the modified schedule, what are we really talking about there? Eight weeks? I, I think I would be comfortable saying a minimum of six weeks, and um, uh, but all, it could, but it could be a quarter. It could be a grading cycle. I'll be okay with that too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just I keep thinking about like the two virus cycles. If we get to six weeks and we're not comfortable, are we going to reconvene to bring kids back three weeks from then? Like I assume we would go, or two weeks from then. I assume we would go six and then another six that that's well, to me seems it, to make the most sense it, it will keep getting yeah i mean we're not going to ignore the data right we're well, always you have to to define what, how you're going to interpret the data right i think that's that's my that's the thing i feel like we're if what, what data that, because are we ignoring are we ignoring the data right now we uh, i mean i uh, the motion had the administration recommending the data that we would be looking at so that we didn't have to determine that now because we're not epidemiologists, nor are we experts in education um, from an administration standpoint, nor are we going to know when those HVAC units come in. There are so many different parameters, and I would rather trust them to make an informed recommendation and have us debate that at another time. And to be clear, I think it's really, really hard to decide, um, you know, recommendations based on data when nobody's back at school yet. Just nobody's back at school yet. So I think that, you know, September 14th, we start and we may have those data points that we look at, as Humara said, administration recommends we look at. But at least after September 14th, I think we're going to get a more clearer picture of the way things are going. Because we know right now, but nobody's in school right now. So what happens after September 14th or 16th or whenever everybody's starting? Karen, you mean, you mean like other public schools around the state? Is that what you mean? What, oh, what colleges. Who's going to be back in school on the 14th? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, the schools around the state, not colleges. I mean, most schools are starting around that time frame, are they? I mean, I'm guessing everyone's starting right around then. Yeah, so we'll watch the other schools that are, as Annie said, most of them are going to be high, but see how they do. And we, you're saying we can learn from that. Is that what you mean? 
potentially. I'm just saying that I think it's hard to decide on, on, you know, saying looking at numbers right now when after school starts, there's going to be a lot more, I think, meaningful data because you're going to have kids back in school and we're going to see what transmission rates transpire to when the community is just more open in general. Agreed. So can we say a minimum of six weeks? I mean, a minimum of six weeks at least sets the expectation that um, we want to start with that. If the data stays the way that it is now, um, then we may be in a very good position, and that's great. But uh, minimum of six weeks also allows you that flexibility of we're not ready yet to move into that next phase, right? Because we did say in these plans that we need to agree in a, in a meeting that we're gonna now move from phase one remote into phase two in-person cohort model. I would just, again, just that clarity. Um, so, cause I can imagine at the end of that six weeks, people just not feeling comfortable. And I think that's all this is gonna come down to. We talk about data. You, you, Heather, you just said 2%. We're below 2%, but people don't feel comfortable. So why is that? Is it the concern that we're going to go above 2% and that's disruptive? Is it the concern that we're not doing remote learning well? So I hear a lot of different messages and I, I want to, A, the, the clarity, and I, I want for me personally that we don't keep going around this because I'm comfortable now. 75, 80% of the parents say they're, or the, the kids that have been on that survey are comfortable coming in, or at least they said they're leaning towards being comfortable. Okay, so this group isn't comfortable. How do we, what is that metric of what comfort looks like? If it's 2%, great, but we're already, we're beating 2%. So it's not 2%, it's something else. Right. And if it's time, I, I, the more compelling argument to me is we need time to sort this out. We need time to see how the, it comes when the, the students come in. That's a very reasonable argument. We need time. I don't, People have used the word rushing. I don't think rushing is appropriate. I think there's been a lot of thought. I think we're moving at expeditious pace given the context. Um, we need time to make sure we got all the facilities together. Those are compelling arguments to me. Right. At a minimum, we're going to take six weeks. That gives clarity to people. We'll reassess. But I don't want in week four us to say, and I really just don't feel comfortable any again. I'm not saying this. I, I know that's what it right. comes to because I think that is this is about subjective comfort. And I don't mean to be uh, derogatory in that. But it'd be helpful if we set some parameters. Well, I agree with you. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, and I think what we're trying to do is show a commitment to those parents that responded saying the majority want their kids back in the building. We, we want to get there too. And a commitment to the educators who the majority of whom said they want to start remote. So in this way, you know, we're trying to serve everyone's needs Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's a good but point. But I, I am totally on board with you that four weeks in, I don't want to be saying, well, I just don't feel right. That, you know, feelings, I get it. We all have feelings, but we, we got to deal in measurable commitments to what we're saying. Um, these are the trends. This is what we had agreed to. Uh, we're ready to go. Fair enough. I like it. Can I, may I say the motion that I think maybe you have, if I, I think you have a motion to begin remote learning for the 2021 school year, uh, to begin the 2021 school year remotely for a minimum of six weeks with the understanding that this period may be extended if public health metrics indicate a return to in-person learning would be unsafe. Said public health metrics will be determined by the committee at a future date as presented and recommended by the administration. Is that what you said more or less? I'm sorry, Annie, this is, uh, I have parents texting me right now about the about this and it's mm -hmm. hard not to pay attention. We're all getting data as quickly as possible. Amherst just voted on something. Can you please repeat that? This is important enough that I don't wanna, I wanna make sure. I think it. what I heard you say that you were looking to begin the 2020-21 school year remotely for a minimum Serious of right six now. weeks with the understanding that this period may be extended if public health metrics indicate a return to in-person learning would be unsafe. Said metrics will be determined at a future meeting by the school committee as, as recommended by the administration. That sounds right to me. My only question is whether the in-person um, needs to also say cohort with it. Because I think what we're talking about is in-person cohort return. Correct. Yes. Okay. 
I feel comfortable moving that. Seconded. Unless that originally my motion. I can't remember. Can we say all in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, I don't agree. Opposed? Paul? Okay. <laughs> That's fine. I, you know, that's, it's, we don't always agree on all things. But I, I get it. It's a great discussion. There's no clear answer. It's hard. Um, Very hard. And I know it is 930. Is it possible for me to just get a few more things that I just need from the committee? So yeah, uh, let's go. we can get to work right. on the next part here. <laughs> so we um, need an approval so on when, the uh, Sorry. We need an approval on the student start date. Yes. September 14th, 2020. Mm -hmm. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I think folks have the background on that. That was a 10 day addition that Desi gave. Um, we also need to discuss the, um, the position on open, unfilled student choice seats. Is that correct, Annie? School choice, yes. I'm sorry. So you voted to, uh, you vote annually to participate in school choice. Um, and I am uh, just wondering if there's anything you'd like me to pursue uh, with legal counsel, which I would have to do anyways, because school choice is governed by law. But um, if you would like to, this has nothing to do with families who are currently enrolled via school choice. Even if you were enrolled and starting next year, but you were already enrolled via school choice, we're not talking about those families. We're talking about unfilled slots. Um, with the school committee, does the school committee have any interest in uh, me ex investigating whether or not we should, we can or should hit the pause button on that until we see how the fall unfolds? I think there's so many um, moving parts right now that um, that we should try to minimize the number of additional variables, like adding new students. I, I guess I have a different understanding. I, I would say, I don't know what the number is. I don't, can't imagine it's a huge number, but if, I imagine though there will be folks looking around and I think we've done a stellar job of putting together a, a safe format uh, in school. So if folks wanna to come to that, uh, and bring their children here, I think, and if we've got space, especially for remote, I, you know, for at least for the six weeks, maybe that's not a bad time as, as everybody's potentially can be a remote for them to assimilate in. Um, so I would be open to it. I don't know what the number we're talking here, Annie. Is, are there a lot of vacancies? Uh, we have, we haven't, uh, we still have a number of vacancies at um, Hopkins. Of course, that would change, you know, depending class size changes, which changes kind of your vacancies. And um, we've just had in the last week, two new applications. So I'm not, I'm not implying some sort of wave, but um, I did want to check with the committee. And, and I'll be honest, I'm thinking past uh, COVID, you know, school choice mm -hmm. is an important um, asset to us. Uh, we, let's be honest, we don't have, you know, had they had what, 23, 24 births uh, a couple of years ago or last year, the most recent mm -hmm. information, you know, other school choice is an important asset to our school surviving. And so uh, if folks want to come here now in this time of crisis, so that they see us performing well and they want to move their children to us, I, I think we should welcome them. So I agree with you, Paul. I, I feel like we've spent a lot of time in our committee meetings talking about how to drive more students to our district, how to uh, continue to market our, our programs and our offerings, the grants that you've received, that you just received. I mean, that to me, I'd, I'd want to be able to share that with any spots that are still open to be able to share that. Sorry, Tara, go ahead. No, it's okay. Um, I agree um, in general about school of choice and um, keeping slots open and allowing others into our district. It has been a really um, important and continuing discussion that we've had. The only thing that gives me caution that I would just wanna make sure of is that um, both of our principals have worked really hard to look at um, our cohorts in the classrooms. And I just wouldn't want the numbers to, I'm not saying that they would, and I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm guessing they wouldn't. I wouldn't want them to change drastically, that it would have to change um, our um, classroom sizes, that it would need to change a lot of our um, 
uh, placement of students because now if we're, we're starting remote, there might be families that are more comfortable coming back as data emerges um, into in-person. Therefore, we might have more fuller classrooms and I wouldn't want to put it so that we're in another space issue if we're trying to keep distance. You said it way more eloquently than I yeah. did. That's exactly what I was trying to get at by saying yet another variable that all of a sudden you have more than 12 students in that cohort. Yeah. That's a good point. It, I mean, I feel like that is that something that we could figure out relatively quickly in terms yeah, I mean, of- Yeah, you wouldn't authorize empty seats unless, I, personally, I don't think we should authorize empty seats unless April and Jen think it's right. reasonable. Can we, can we leave it open-ended to leave it in the hands of Annie, April, and Jen to say, to author, yeah, exactly what you're saying, Paul, authorize those open seats up until it would make a change making classroom- Cohort um, management okay. impossible. Yeah. Really? Yeah, and leave it in their hands so it's not something we have to come back at to discuss. We label to leave it that. Really, the only issue it's, it's right, we faced this before, right, Jumeirah and Heather, and Annie, it's when we bump up against the school uh, class size and had to consider the, an additional teacher, right? And, yeah, and I think in this case, we'd have to be considering those space allocations, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, yeah. At which I agree, you know. Uh, uh, not an expert on that. I'd rather trust the administration to say where class sizes can or cannot tolerate another school choice seat. So I hear you saying, which I don't think you have to take a motion. I just want to get your advice here, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm hearing you correctly. I hear you saying that you are comfortable, and if this is correct, it would be f reflected in the minutes, that you are comfortable with the administration making a determination as to how many do not violate any school choice laws, it's still a lottery, it's still first comes first serve. If we determine that there is space, that the number of slots may be less than were originally indicated in the spring due to the situation that we're in now, and that you're comfortable with me checking with legal, that that is something that we can do. Did I get that right? Well, I just wanna make sure that we're not saying, because we've always voted on a cap and we're not saying we're, we want to increase that cap, but what we're saying is we're willing to go closer to the cap if it doesn't mess our cohort numbers up. And if recommended by the administration. Correct. Okay. I think that's what we're saying. So do we need a motion to for that or Annie? No, because I first need to ask the attorney because what you vote every year is you vote to participate and you actually vote slots, which is why when there was one error, I had to bring it back, so you vote the slots. So I'm just going to check with legal and say that the school committee would like to the administration to have the authority to make a decision about whether or not this will create problems with cohorts in an in-person cohort and reduce the slots accordingly, the number of slots, if it does. Um, that's what I'm hearing you saying, and I'm going to check with legal counsel. So am I asking legal counsel the right question? We reduce the number of slots. Um, if uh, we think there's a problem with the size of the cohort. Yeah. But I would want that, you know, we'd want that communicated to us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think that has to assume with 100% in-person numbers. Yes. Quick question about that, Annie. I just don't know if it matters. Mm -hmm. You're saying cohort specifically. So would that apply to any of the schedules? Because uh, my problem question isn't actually about the cohort model, it's about the regular in-person model because the loss of a full-time teacher. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that matters in your questioning, but I just wanted, just wanted to make sure that was considered. Uh, yes, so that's important that that's considered. I think for my original question to the attorney, um, it doesn't because the broader question is, um, what's possible under school choice once their deadlines so what's possible under school choice and making adjustments in these very unusual circumstances but that is helpful april so now i'm just going to start with getting talking to the attorney about uh what what flexibility we have under school choice um okay i swear i'm almost finished with understanding what we need to do next um, so we, you've made a motion that we'll be in person for the first, uh, at least six weeks. The, the uh -huh. guidance and the uh, law, remote, also, remote. Uh, I'm sorry, remote, excuse me. The guidance and the, um, thank you, Humera, 
the guidance from DESE is clear um, and under uh, Individual with Disabilities and Education Act that we have to prioritize in-person learning experiences at a minimum for the following population. Students with disabilities, English language learners, students who have a lack of access to technology or internet in their home, um, students, uh, very young children, and um, families for whom home is not conducive to learning. That is not to imply that they have dangerous or unsuitable environments. It could just be it's simply not conducive to learning. And um, if we can't accommodate, uh, prioritize all of those learners, we must start with students with disabilities and English language learners. So to Humera's point, um, I don't even know, frankly, that the starting point is um, identifying the first two groups, which we don't need a survey for. Um, and then from those groups, determining um, if those families would like to access in-person learning even while we are remote. Um, and then from there, uh, if it turns out that um, there are, then we can move into the next phases of, um, actually, I'm sorry, students with disabilities, English language learners, and lack of access all have to be accounted for. And if those folks don't want to come in, they're going to learn remotely, um, then we'll start moving to looking at other groups. So I will be surveying those families of those, of those children to determine whether or not they intend to access some form of in-person learning even while we are remote. Um, and uh, I think that was it, the survey. And then I will be looking at a subsequent meeting and um, I don't know that that can wait till August 21st, so maybe we can set another one now because we either we can discuss this now or we can just set another meeting. Um, I just want to be much clearer about what specifically um, in terms, I, I heard a lot and it was very helpful, but in terms of improving that remote learning plan, um, it, would, it would be helpful for me to hear greater specificity and you folks obviously have to deliberate that publicly. It's not something that um, you can deliberate offline. So uh, perhaps we set another meeting to discuss that. Does that sound reasonable? Yes, it does. Also, um, you mentioned in the various categories of uh, English language learners and um, something else. And then you mentioned accessibility. By accessibility, um, we're talking about internet, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like I'd like to get your um, perspectives at that next meeting about how many people that might be and whether we can do something um, different. If that, if those families would love to be safer and uh, take advantage of Chromebooks and internet that is supplied to them, um, would that solve the accessibility issue? I, I just, I wanna get clear on that by our next meeting. Yes. Okay. And um, can we set that for next week? Because what I will need to do, we voted on a start, but um, I don't know that we, uh, we didn't approve the plan. So um, I will take the department up on the extension and um, uh, request uh, to submit one plan at this point, uh, remote learning plan that will still, even when we submit it, still be um, subject to uh, a mutually agreeable memorandum of understanding with the HEA. Um, so what is, what is people's availability next week? Can we meet a week from tonight on the 13th? Yeah. Well, if you don't, the, the problem becomes there is the 14th will be my hard and fast stop to get this to the department now. So if there are any issues with what I present, then um, that's a bit of a challenge to get it uploaded on the 14th. Is there any possibility? Um, I mean, even, let's see. Uh -huh. Are there other, yeah, and that's what it has to be, that's any fine. Night, but. Any night that week's fine with me. I yeah, can't so, well. Secondly, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I can um, argue, but I'm also not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm flexible, let's do I'm it. I'm unable to do the 12th. So, can I ask a quick clarifying question. Sure. You said we are submitting the remote plan as is, Annie. No, I'm suggesting that um, I we hold a meeting next week and um, for that. say 
for to submit to the school committee the best that we can do uh, in this time frame so that I can submit something by Friday, August 14th and let the department know that, of course, it is subject to an agreed upon and signed MOU. So is it possible, uh, even if it's six o'clock, is it possible to do Tuesday the 11th? Yes. Yes. I can do it at six, yeah. Does that give you enough time, Annie, to turn around all this data and get agreement and... Uh, I won't have a signed MOU by then, but I'll let the department know that um, I shouldn't say that. I mean, maybe, but I, no, I won't have a signed it, MOU by then. Does it um, increase our chances by, I mean, I, I just, I, I have to ask, does it increase our chances if we give ourselves a week for you to get a lot more accomplished? Um, and, you know, obviously you're going to share with us plans as they emerge. So it won't, we won't be going into the 13th cold um, such that you could submit it on the 14th. And, as I was saying earlier, I just, I can't see them drop kicking Hadley for getting it in on the, you know, hitting the submit button on the 15th. I'm not saying willful disobedience, but honestly, I just- Okay, I don't so know. Thursday, um, uh, what's today right now? It's Thursday right now, right? Um, so that's fine. We could do Thursday the 13th. I personally would prefer to, to meet the, the deadline. That's not me just trying to be a do. I, I just would really like to meet the department's deadline on that. And if you were to try to meet the department's deadline, what's the date that works for you? The 12th doesn't work, Humera, so we would do so, Well, I understand which is, if, if that it's Thursday night now, and so that becomes Tuesday. Um, just to give you a lot of cycles with the people you're collaborating with and the data that you want to get, and I just... I don't see how you. But any, so we can do Thursday the 13th. Time, time for feedback though is probably important. Each meeting you've said that we have to improve our plan and that it's not specific enough. So I, I do worry that if we meet Thursday night, we're gonna have to try to rush to complete something Friday, talk to those people again. You know, So I just feel like Tuesday does give more time. We still have Monday and Tuesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would not support a vote where we knowingly disregard that state timeline because I don't know the consequences, Humera, and there might be, right? And so even from just a reputational perspective, I'm sure any you would not want to do that. So if we, but it's Tuesday, you're going to be bit no matter what, right? The timeline is going to be compressed no matter what. So we compress it between now and Tuesday, and then we have time to do something and revise further so that we can get it in by Friday. Mm -hmm. Can we do Tuesday? Tuesday would be the 11th? Yep. Can folks do that? Yes. 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 I'm just going to ask, do you need both nights, Annie? Do we need to meet both yeah. times? Yeah, good question. To get it posted. We could, we could put a placeholder on. I could. Yeah. Could you do that? Because I, I have to remember to get this posted. Let's tomorrow. just do yeah. Tuesday and Thursday. We can talk Tuesday, get that input, and then Thursday, wrap it up if that's what we need to do. <laughs> yep. uh, I, like, I like that plan. On either yeah. And, uh, and Thursday at 5.30, and you make a good point, I will do everything in my power to get this posted within the 48 hour timeline tomorrow, but um, it's short notice too. I mean, I, I can't be certain that the person who does the posting doesn't have a vacation day tomorrow. Uh, so, so we'll hold both dates. Somebody told me it was summer. <laughs> so we'll hold both dates. So we What's have like? Tuesday the 11th at 6 p.m. and Thursday the 13th at 5.30 p.m. Um, and uh, we will uh, come with what will turn into, at this point, just for the, the purposes of the 14th, is a single, uh, single remote plan for the first six weeks of school. What I will ask the commissioner for is um, uh, and, it, and the ability to revise the other plans that I already had submitted as initial plans for the remainder of the school year. Well, they were, I mean, they were submitted as draft as, I mean, yep. in progress. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was all submitted on the 31st. Yep. All yep. right, sounds good. Okay. And we have two other regularly scheduled meetings, one on the 24th and one on the 31st of August, both are at 6 p.m. Um, the mm -hmm. one on the 24th is our district strategy and superintendent goals, and the 31st is our regular uh, school committee meeting. 
Mm -hmm. um, can I say just before we adjourn that I really appreciate you all and there's no one else I'd rather be making this really hard, hard decision with than you all. Thank you. Thank you. You're here. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the 83 participants that are still on. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Clock. <laughs> well, there were a hundred before and I know I, I do. still pretty good. Oh, you got one back. It's 84 now. Yeah. Oh, all right. It's the next. Um, Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Have a good night, everybody. Good night, Thank everyone. You.